and so good evening hi everyone welcome to the red lounge my name is roberto procaccini i am the editor-in-chief of la conceria a news magazine focused on the leather industry that i deeply suggest you to follow so we are here for the seminar traceability and circularity in the international leather supply chain a huge topic that we are going to enlighten by several points of view in a rich program of speech for the first panel, I have the honor to introduce you Luca Boltri. Luca Boltri is the Vice Director of UNICH, the organization that represents the, leather, the Italian leather industry. UNICH, UNICH year by year publishes a report of sustainability, and Luca Boltri is here to show us the results and achievements of the Italian leather industry in the 2022. Thank you, Roberto, and uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, Roberto introduced me, so I, there's no need for me to, to, to say more. Uh, just welcome to Linea Pelle, if this is the first day you come here. Um, as uh, well, it, it has become a, a sort of tradition that in Linea Pelle we organize uh, events like uh, uh, this one, ev events dedicated to sustainability issues uh, in particular, today we will uh, focus on uh, traceability and uh, uh, cir circularity. We have a lot of, uh, of speakers, uh, international speakers. And uh, my intervention, my presentation, it will be very short, just to give you some information, some uh, data, some updates about uh, uh, the sustainability report of, uh, of UNICH. Uh, just a few words about it, uh, UNICH started to publish the sustainability report of the Italian tanning industry 20 years ago and uh, you have uh, the, the paper copy of the last issue, the last edition in uh, the tables in, uh, in the room. Um, my intervention will be just a sort of introduction of, uh, the, other, uh, of the other speakers. So I will be very short, and anyway, I will answer to any question that you will have at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you don't know who we are, UNICH is the association officially representing the Italian tanning uh, industry. We were founded in 1946. We are a member of Confindustria. We are a private non-profit association whose mission is to promote Italian leather widespread the knowledge about the Italian tanning uh, industry, to provide the services to our assets to sure, and to fostering the innovation of the industry in terms of social and environmental role. We are based uh, here in Italy, and uh, we, here in Milan, and we, in Italy we have also offices in the three main Italian tanning districts, in, Tus in Tuscany, in Veneto, and in Campania. We are a member of several uh, uh, national and international bodies. Confindustria Moda here in Italy is the federation of association uh, representing the fashion industry, COTANS, the European Confederation of Tanneries, ICT, the International Council of Tanneries, and several other bodies. A technical body in Italy, UNI, uh, in, uh, at a, a European level, the uh, CN, TC289, and the technical committee at ISO level, the world standard body. We also collaborate with SARCA, that is uh, one of the most important uh, uh, multi-platform uh, initiative for uh, uh, chemicals in the, the fashion industry. Uh, sorry, Z this is Z ZDHC, sorry, SARCA is um, a, a multi-platform body uh, regarding the sustainability of the reptile um, uh, leather supply chain. We have partnership with uh, some NGOs. One is WUF, uh, Fernando Bellese of WUF will speak uh, after me, uh, also about our collaboration, and WF, a US uh, NGO um, uh, operating in the environmental field, is also one of our collaborators. We partner with these uh, entities uh, with the main aim of exchanging ideas, exchanging inputs. Sustainability is always an open issue, so we think it is very important for our industry to be open, to listen to other kind of stakeholders, other than those that we usually collaborate with. That is, for sure, our suppliers of uh, raw material, of chemicals, of technology, our clients, um, um, and many other different uh, operator, uh, trade operators inside the, the, uh, the, supply, uh, the supply chain. Uh, we are also part of the UN Global Compact, uh, or the Magna Carta, of uh, 
uh, we are part of a traceability project uh, with uh, UNECH and we have become uh, last month also member of the monitor for circular fashion a, um, sustainability, a fashion sustainability initiatives uh, uh, organized by Isda Bocconi and uh, uh, Francesca Romana Rinaldi will be one of the speakers uh, in this event. We are in Inapel. Uh, I think you all know uh, Linapel. Linapel is one of the most important traditional leather fair. Uh, this edition is 101st. So uh, Linapel has been organized for the last 50 years. It's one of the most important meeting points for the international fashion industry. And uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, we in the, last, in the last year, we have enriched the, uh, the fair with the organization of events like this. We think that a trade fair is not, always, or is, is, is not only a moment where the demand and the offer of products meet, but it is also a moment for exchanging ideas, for debating about uh, the trend of the market, and to debate, in this case, about uh, the sustainability initiatives, the sustainability project, the sustainability issues of the international leather supply chain. Uh, this edition of Linapelle, well, we can say that we have almost get back to the old times, I mean, to the times before the COVID-19. So uh, the figures about this edition of Linapelle are similar to those before the COVID. So we have nearly 1,200 uh, uh, exhibitors coming from 40 countries uh, all over, from all over the world, and we expect to have uh, uh, from 16 to 20,000 visitors from all over the world. So I stop the introduction. I just give you some uh, information about uh, um, our uh, our report. You know, the Italian tanning industry is uh, a key player in the uh, international leather supply, supply chain. Italy accounts for nearly two-thirds of the European uh, leather production and 23% uh, on global, uh, global leather production in terms of, uh, of value. The luxury segment, the luxury fashion world is for sure one of the most, uh, I'm going to say, um, important partners of, uh, of, our, uh, of our tanneries. This range of market accounts for nearly 40% of our total uh, production and sustainability for sure is uh, a priority objective for our industry and probably one of the elements, the most important element composing uh, the high quality of our production. I always say that sustainability for Italian tanneries is like oxygen. Without a strong commitment on sustainability, probably we wouldn't have such a strong tanning industry nowadays in Italy. And uh, we can go. And uh, we have started to, to draw, to publish our uh, sustainability report in 2003 uh, because we felt the need to communicate the, all uh, the several efforts made by our tanneries in the different fields that compose sustainability. The Italian tanning industry, you will see afterwards, is co mainly composed by small and medium enterprise. The average dimension of an Italian tannery is 15 people per company. Uh, this doesn't mean that we don't have very big group. We have very big, big group with several hundreds of uh, 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 employees, but the average dimension of an Italian tannery is 15 person. So we serve a, a universe of small and medium enterprise that in many cases do not really know how sustainable they already are. So we provided a sort of tool and this is the sustainability report, gathering information, gathering data, gathering results from our tanneries, elaborating them, and so giving you an image about what we do, what our industry does in terms of sustainability in the environmental field, in the social field, and in the, gover in the governance or ethical field. As I said, this, is a, 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 this has been quite a long journey. Uh, this is the 20th edition of the sustainability report. Uh, probably we will change a little bit the, 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 uh, the, nar the, nar the narrative of uh, the report in the future. But let me say that even in these last 20 years, the report has changed a lot. We have tried to uh, enrich the, the, uh, the report, uh, also following the development of uh, 
the sustainability in the last uh, in the last year. Sustainability has become a sort of magic word. Everybody talks about sustainability. Everybody is sustainable uh, nowadays. Uh, um, but for sure, if we compare uh, this discussion and the elements composing this discussion 20 years ago, 30 years ago, now the, the, uh, I would say the, um, the, the, uh, the number of issues that, that compose the sustainability of our industry for sure has risen a lot. And these are the main issues that in our opinion compose the sustainability of, uh, um, of, a leather uh, of a leather producer. We always follow, we always try to follow a sort of uh, holistic approach. We think that sustainability must be uh, analyzed, must be discussed, must be communicated uh, through a fully comprehensive approach. So there is a social part that de deals with industrial relationship, with health and safety in the workplace, with the human resources, the valorization of human uh, uh, resources, and the relation with the communities. Uh, our industry is mainly organized in districts, so it is very, very important the relationship between the tanneries and the place where the, uh, the tanneries are located. From an environmental point of view, we deal with the circularity issue. We deal with emission, solid waste, wastewater, consumption of resources, and life cycle assessment and environmental footprint. This, uh, this morning, uh, SPIN 360 and Federico deals a lot with, uh, uh, with this very important issue about uh, sustainability in our supply chain. And for sure, there are the issues related to the governance of, uh, uh, of companies. So leather product safety and consumer protection in terms of chemical management, zero deforestation. We have WWF talking about the deforestation issue um, in South America um, and in other parts of the world. Animal welfare has become another very important issue related to sustainability in our, in our industry. Traceability and transparency and made in. All these issues are taken into consideration and analyzed in our report. Maybe not all the issue with the same depth in this edition, but in the, last, in, the, in the past edition, for sure, we were in-depth focus on many of these different aspects. I would like to follow a little bit some of the contents of this report, and, this, and then I will give the floor to the other uh, to their speakers, or if there are questions. Just starting with uh, why leather is sustainable by nature. We have uh, used this, uh, with this uh, disclaim, uh, the inimit inimitable nature of leather. At first, because uh, well, leather comes origin from a food industry waste. There are the bovine hides and the sheep goat skin that are animal byproducts, also defined in this way by uh, uh, the related uh, European regulation. The wasted from the tanning process can be recovered and re reused in other different sectors. This is a particular true in, uh, here in, uh, in Italy. Leather is alternative to plastic. There is a fossil derived, no renewable and poorly biodegradable material. And it's a poor bio-based material. It's uh, consisting of at least 85% of collagen that is a full biodegradable material. And has unique features in terms of performance, among which high durability and high reparability. These are the numbers related to our industry. So this is uh, the, 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 sum, uh, the, the summing up of the uh, socioeconomic framework. Uh, I told you uh, a small and medium enterprise. We have 1,000 and nearly 200 tanneries here in Italy with um, uh, nearly 8,000 employees in total. 85% uh, of these employees are employed with a permanent contract. This is quite important to take into consideration from a, a social responsibility point of view. 60% are foreign workers and the female incidence on uh, the tanning employees uh, is 80% on, uh, on total. Uh, as I said, small and medium enterprise, mainly family, family owned, located in industrial districts. Our main clients, you know, fashion industry, that is footwear, 33% of our uh, uh, leather sales go to footwear clients, followed by leather goods sector, automotive sector, furniture sector, and garments sector. 
In terms of uh, uh, raw material, we mainly process bovine hides. 79% of our raw materials comes from bovine animal, young, um, um, and 7% of young bovines, that is calves as well. Sheep 8% and goat 6%. There is uh, a remaining part of the production uh, um, coming from uh, diversified niches. Uh, there is pigs, uh, deer, uh, fishes, reptiles, but as I said, this is a very small niche uh, uh, right now. This slide uh, uh, gives you an idea about the circularity model of our, uh, of our industry. As I said, uh, leather is circular by nature because we recover a waste from the food industry, and uh, we uh, process it and transform it into a very flexible uh, and high-performance material that is leather. But in Italy, we have developed a system of recoveries and the reuse of the waste produced during the tanning processes. So sludge, shaving, trimming, splits, and other process waste are recovered in order to produce fertilizer and biostimulants for agriculture, gelatin and collagen for the food industry, and the granulates and conglomerates for construction. These are the last data regarding the production of wastes in our industry. This data comes from a sample of uh, tanneries representing more than 20% on total and fully representative of the, I would say, high heterogeneity of uh, our leather production. Anyway, the last data say that uh, uh, waste is that um, goes to for recovery are now at 72.5% on, on total. That for a square meter of finished leather produced in Italy, we produce 1.38 kilogram of waste is and 2.9 kilogram of byproducts. And 97%, uh, more than 97% of our waste is are not hazardous. These are the last data regarding the consumption of resources. This is another very important element about the sustainability of uh, leather production. Uh, the fact that we have developed mm, a monitoring of the, environment, uh, of the environmental perform performances of our tanneries in the last 20 years uh, allows us to build uh, a historical series about data. So we can uh, proudly say that the water consumption of uh, our tanneries decreased by 30% in the last uh, uh, 20 years. The consumption of chemicals decreased by 6% from 2007. This is the first year when we monitor this, uh, uh, this indicator. And uh, the reduction of pollutants in wastewater, COD, suspended solids, as we can see, are absolutely very remarkable. In terms of high emission, the last data coming from our report say that for one square meter of leather produced, we produce 2.28 CO2 equivalent, while on the side of uh, energy efficiency, we can say that, uh, we can probably say that 83% of the energy used by our tanneries, by the same of our tanneries, come from uh, um, renew uh, renewable resources. And the energy consumption decreased by 25%, so one-fourth in the last 20, 20 years. On the social side, uh, we monitor the number of accidents that occurred in our industry. In uh, 2021, this is our last year available. These are data coming from INAIL, that is the National Institutes Monitoring uh, uh, Health and Safety in, uh, in Italy, uh, 565 accidents, uh, and uh, in the last 20 years, the rate of ac the accident rates on total employees decreased by nearly 40%. This is a clear proof about the fact that working in the Italian tanning industry is safe and is more and more safe. Also, training and, edu and education compose the commitments of our industry in terms of sustainability. These are the data regarding the activities performed by our group, for sure. And uh, youth training, uh, we organized more than 100 courses in 2021 with uh, 3,800 participants, uh, more than 
230 hours of lessons. Uh, and we also organize the courses for supply chain operators, for clients that wish to know more about uh, the tanning production, about leather as a material. Uh, we organized the 47 courses last year and more than 90 hours of, of lessons. That's it. If you have any question, I will be delighted to answer. Otherwise, we can go on and give space to the other. Luca, maybe if you want, I have one question. That's a question. It was a question or it was a ciao ciao? <laughs> no, it was a ciao ciao. <laughs> <laughs> Luca, I, I'd like to stress out a topic. You about the circularity of the tanning industry. Yeah. Because you say that eyes and skins are a byproduct of the meat industry. But someone says that eyes and skins are a co-product of the meat industry. Can you explain us what is the truth, which are the differences? Well, I'm not saying that it is a, a, a byproduct of the food industry. The European Commission <laughs> issued a regulation and the rights and skin are included as uh, byproducts, animal byproducts. But even in terms of, uh, from an economical point of view, uh, for example, our friends of the Leather and Hide Council of America, that is the association representing the U.S. tanneries, uh, um, uh, through the help of the University of uh, Montana, if I will remember, they made an economic econometric studies that prove that the demand of leather and the demand of raw hides coming from our industry doesn't do not influence at all the number of cattle raised and the number of animals that are uh, killed. These animals are killed and raised for food purposes, so this is uh, something that, well, maybe people, uh, mm, some public outside here are not aware about this, but this is uh, absolutely, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, is one of the pillar of our, uh, of our industry from forever. Okay, thank you, Luca. There is any question from the audience? No? So, thank you. Thank you. The second panel, and applause, please. Uh, the second panel brings us to Brazil. I'd like to call it on the stage Fernando Beleza, Senior Director, Beef and Leather Supply Chain for WWF US. Please, Fernando. And Earl W. Schenk, who leads the traceability work for Tapestry, the holding that owns coach Stuart Weizmann, Ekid Spade. Earl, would you, would you join us? He just can do that. He prefers? Okay, the, the title of this panel is uh, Leveraging Collaboration to Fight Deforestation. So our guests will explain us uh, what are they doing, an NGO and uh, a fashion house for, f to fi for fighting deforestation and how they can cooperate. So please, Fernando. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope I don't have some Nutella on my face, but I just had time to grab some, some cookies between presentations. Thank you very much for your time and, and availability to, to, to hear some of the, the experiences we, ha we have here to, to share with you. Uh, the idea, as, as Roberto introduced, well, I, I'm, I'm just a bit lost here. I don't know where I should stare at. But uh, it's to, to share how we are collaborating with the, the beef, the leather sector, and how we are together building solutions to, to fight deforestation. Um, just a quick introduction for those who don't know us. Uh, I work for WWF. We are a, cons a conservation organization. We've been around for about 64 years. We are present in, in, in over 100 countries. And the way we look at conservation, we look at uh, biodiversity as the, the center of, of conservation, but we understand that the, the topic is more complex and we need to, to look at the, the interactions between biodiversity, landscapes, people around those landscapes, 
industry, uh, private sector, and we need to see how we can work all those things together to ensure we are able to make uh, to, to to help nature and people to thrive. I personally, I, I work for a, a team that's called Markets. And, and what we do, we work directly with private sector associations, uh, different stakeholders to try to, to build those solutions together. We believe that we need to understand the problem in order to, to solve it. Uh, and, and when we talk about deforestation, when we talk about forests, we need to, before addressing it, we need to understand what causes deforestation. And, and today, when you think about South America, it's where we are working more actively and the, the, the projects I'm, I've been involved with uh, uh, are, are focused on South America, but of course we work all over the world. But when you look at South America, the main driver for de deforestation is agriculture. Uh, this is a, a very interesting picture because it, it shows a very advanced system where agriculture has become very efficient. In this farm, for example, you are you are able to harvest 2.4 crops, uh, harvests per, per year. They, they, what they are doing there, they are harvesting soy while they are already seeding uh, corn. It's very efficient, but uh, it doesn't show much biodiversity there. You see, it's almost, you could call it a, a desert if it wasn't for, for the crop. But we have two things, we, we need food. We know that uh, the, the global population will continue to increase. Right now, as it was mentioned this morning, the global population has reached 8 billion people. It's gonna reach 10 billion people by in the next 20 to 30 years before it, it peaks and, and, and starts reducing. It's predicted that to, to feed all that people, we're gonna have to increase food production in 70%. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot because we are not only looking at uh, uh, population increasing, but we are looking also at uh, uh, improving livelihoods. So you have people getting more access to, to, to better diets, more balanced diets, so we'll need a lot more food. And uh, to do that, what we must do? We must produce more with less. Sound, sounds easy, but uh, it's a bit more, more complicated. The good news is that experience has shown us that this is something doable, that there are uh, a lot of things being created, uh, that there's a lot of evolution and we are seeing uh, that it's possible to, to achieve that. This graph, I don't expect you to be able to read it, but the message is very clear. This is from Brazil. The, the blue line is, is cattle production, the green line is soya production, and the orange bars, they, they are deforestation rates until 2016. You can see that both beef and soy produ production increased considerably wi while they reduced deforestation. Be careful because that's an old graph, it's uh, until 2016, and in the last uh, eight years, the, the, the trend, seven years, the, the trend has changed, but it's more about political issues, about some, some approaches that maybe are not the, the, the best ones, but the graph shows well that it's possible to make more with less. A and, and that's where we are trying to approach, that's the direction we, we are trying to go. When you think about cattle production, I'm emphasizing here cattle production because we are at Linea Pelli, uh, a leather fair, and it's where impacts most of you. Cattle production is one of the the main drivers for deforestation in, 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 Bra in Brazil, South America. So if you look at Amazon, Cerrado, Gran Chaco Bioma, the, the cattle is the, the, the main driver for deforestation. But we also know, as I mentioned about food production, cattle production will increase. This is a fact. So we need to make sure that we are making it right, we are producing cattle responsibly, and we are decoupling cattle production from deforestation. The complexity here is that uh, when you look at the countries where you have more deforestation, when you look at those biomes, the, 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 the producers, they are not the same. You have a, a, a whole range of, of producers and for each of those kinds, you, you need to, to address differently. So it's, it's, a very, it's a very complex topic, but by engaging the sector, we think we, we can find the solutions. Leather is a consequence of, of beef production but it's also responsible for, uh, it's par at least partially responsible we need to consider. So we need to engage and we need to be part of, of the solution as well. 
here I just want two two things. First, it's to show uh, in, in beef production in Brazil uh, involves more than five million farms, and then probably 20, 30 million people are involved directly with beef production. So we have a social issue here. We we cannot just ignore this this sector. We need to work to fix it. Leather is the same thing, but the other thing that I, I like about this slide is that while most of the, the beef production from South America is stays in South America, is consumed by South, America's, South Americans, most of the leather produced there is exported. So leather has also a very important role in connecting markets such as Europe, such as the US, such as China, to, to the producers. And when I say connecting those markets, I, I, I say helping to, to share those markets' views, help to, to, to communicate in the issues, and, and helping to, to, to engage the, the right stakeholders to make the solution, to, to get the solution. And it's a bit boring, the topic, probably, but why does that impact to brands and, and many of you who are supplying to, to brands? There are a few reasons. When you think about climate change, this is the hottest topic we have at the moment. We have to solve climate change. And uh, this is a, an interesting uh, uh, table. If you look, uh, it's, it's hard to, to read here, but uh, there, there are four scenarios. The second one, it's if we, if we are able to, ma to, to manage emissions to stay within the, the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in, in global temperature, you're going to see that we're going to have already a, a lot of climate impact, negative uh, uh, impact. So drought is, is, is forecasted to, to increase 2.4, uh, rain 1.5, snow is going to reduce in, in 5%, we're going to have 10% more cyclones. That is if we reach only the, if we increase only the 1.5% uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, which a lot of scientists say that's not possible. So if you start in, uh, have a, having a higher increase, the, the, the impacts are much higher. So we need to address this, this quickly. And uh, another interesting thing that impacts directly suppliers and brands, we are talking every day about climate uh, commitments, uh, emissions reductions. We, are, we, we like now to talk about carbon neutral, carbon uh, positive, and, and so on. The fact is, if we are not able to address deforestation in the supply chain, we will not meet any of those targets. Just to give an idea, if you, if you have leather from deforest deforested areas, the emissions can be 11 times higher than a leather uh, without deforestation. When you think about poop, uh, wood products, those emissions can s be six times higher. So if we want to, to deliver the, the commitments we are making in terms of climate change, in terms of, of uh, uh, emission reductions, we need to deal with land use change, we need to, to deal with deforestation. Also, I think this is the topic of the, the moment, regulations, laws. Uh, the, 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 the most well-known right now is the EU legislation but there are many others. You see the same trends happening in UK. You see the discussions happening in the US. Deforestation and conversion-free legislations will become the norm. The sooner we start preparing ourselves to, to, to address that, to, to comply with those legislations, that, that the better we'll be prepared. We will avoid losing access to market and we will be able to, to, to sustain uh, the business uh, that we are engaged uh, on. It, it, and sorry if I'm being a bit negative, but I think it's important to, 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 to set the landscape. But the, the, the good thing is that there are things that can be done. And, and uh, it, there, there, there are ways of solving the, the issues. And, and that's the role we, WWF, we are trying to, to, to support. And, and by working with, with you all, we believe we can address the, the issue. This is a, a, a simple graph to, to explain a, a complicated topic, but what companies need to do when they are developing sustainable sources, they, they need to, to start from understanding wh where they are, to understand the, the, the exposure they have, the risks, to, to understand the, their supply chains. So with, with having, by having that information, you can start making uh, the, the, the right decisions towards creating strategies, towards uh, setting your own policies, 
towards engaging your your suppliers and and and, and implementing those things of course you, you you have to create a lot of actions you you have to to to, to work hard to, to to get those things rolling you need to start monitoring understanding the the the, the efficiency of your actions and, and, and review those those steps from time to time. And WWF helps in all those steps. We we de developed strategies, we developed uh, tech, uh, tools that you can help to, 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 to understand all those steps from assessment to, to commitments to, to, to reporting. We also convene companies, convene sectors to, to work together. We, by the fact we are present all over the world, we, we try to, to, to identify what's working, what's not, and bringing people together to, to address those things. Just to, to, to make it look a bit more complicated, tho those four pillars here, it's just some, some guidelines. It's some of the, the, the actions you need to cover to, to, to implement a, 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 a deforestation and conversion free supply chain. You don't have to read it. I just want to, to, to scare you a little bit that it's a, it's a complex topic. You need to start understanding, setting policies, creating traceability systems, and, and so on. But uh, we, we try to, to support that process. Another interesting tool we've created, another good example that I like to use, we have a tool that's called DCF Implementation Toolkit. And sorry, I, very often I say DCF. DCF stands for Deforestation and Conversion Free. So this toolkit, it's, it's a publicly available. It's something you can download from WWF's website, and it's something that helps you to assess uh, the, 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 the exposure you have. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple survey that anybody can answer in, 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 in about in, in under an hour. After you answer it, it gives you a plan that you can start populating with your, your information, and, and in, the, in the last stage, it, uh, it, it connects you with other resources available that you can use in that journey. This is a process that a company can do by itself. It's a process that sometimes we, we create uh, groups to, to work together a, as hubs, but uh, it's, it's just another example of, of uh, what can be done. We also have been convening, working together with the industry to, to, to understand, not, not only build solutions, but more important, understand what is out there already and, and, and share that information with, with stakeholders so everybody can, can make use of those things. Just to give you some more concrete examples right now, we are working with different pilots in South America. We have pilots in Brazil, in Paraguay, in, in, in Argentina, where we are working with companies there. They, they have already their monitoring systems. They have traceability systems that are working. And we are, we are sitting with them. We are working with them to understand how far th those systems go, what else needs to be developed, how we can support those things. Because uh, if we always start creating new approaches, it, it just generates confusion. So we try to work together to, to who is already there and, and to, to who is already addressing the issue so we can give scale to, to those, to those uh, processes. We, we are also collaborating with a, a lot of organizations. We are working here with iCheck, with Unich. Thank you very much for helping us to, to, to be here talking to you, Textile Exchange, Leather Working Group, and many other stakeholders. In Brazil, we are talking with CICB because, again, we need to work together. And, and, and last, another example of how we work, uh, we, we received a grant from the Tapestry Foundation last year where they, they, they gave that this, this grant to us to help us to develop a, 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 de a deforestation, and deforestation and conversion free supply chain. So we, we are using those resources to, to create a pre-competitive environment. We are looking at a lot of different things, assessing the sector, developing new tools, creating groups. We have, we have the, the intention, we are just uh, finalizing now the, the, the rules of engagement, but we're gonna create a, a group to help us to, to discuss this topic where we'll be inviting leading companies to, to, to join this group in this process. Uh, we, we are looking if we can create funds, if we can create uh, incent incentives tools, so that there's a lot of work in, uh, happening there. The, the grant also helps us to, 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 to implement reforestation projects to support communities where cattle is being raised in Brazil. We, we hopefully we will expand to other regions in, in, in South America. But it's a, it's a very good example how we, we collaborate. 
this is probably one of the, the best cases, but there, there are different levels you, you can do, you know, it's a, we can start very small just by, by sharing networks, sharing experiences, and, 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 uh, and, and the limit is, is really connected to, to our ambitions and, uh, and how much we want to, to address the problem. What I'm, I would like to do now is to, to invite Earl. He works for Tapestry. He manages uh, traceability for Earl, so he can also share some of his experiences and, and, and how they, they, they are addressing this topic. Thank, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Fernando, and, and thank you to, to Unich for, for having us join this, this conversation as well. I will be somewhat brief in my introduction. I, I do just want to let everyone know who I am and my role in this and the way that we structured this as a business and as a, a, a philanthropic entity as well. So um, quick background, as mentioned, uh, my name is Earl Shank. Uh, I lead the traceability work at Tapestry, the business. Um, Tapestry the Business is the U.S.-based uh, house of, of luxury brands, including Coach, Kate Spade, and Stuart Weitzman. And in 2019, the business established a public goal to achieve 95% mapping and traceability of our raw materials in order to ensure a more transparent and responsible supply chain by 2025. And that really kicked off our journey of traceability and doing the work to understand more about where our fibers, materials, and products were coming from. And that gave us the, the background to in 2021 when the Tapestry Foundation was stood up to to inform the foundation about what we saw as really an industry opportunity. Um, we knew that this problem, as Fernando mentioned, was, was bigger than just us. We knew that we could, we could take it on as a business and, and do our best, but we knew that this was a, a challenge or an opportunity that was best solved as a collaborative approach by um, all parts of the value chain, uh, inclusive of different sectors, including civil society. Um, we knew and, and had a sense that there was regulation on the horizon. We were feeling media reports. We knew our ambitions as a modern house of luxury were to reduce our environmental imprint or footprint. And so we recognized that opportunity to, to put this seed funding forward uh, to get WWF started on this work. Um, and so I'll pause there. I, I think we have a bit of a, a panel planned. Um, happy to answer questions and excited to, to have you all here listening to this conversation. Okay, any question from the audience for our guests? Fernando, I'd, I'd like to ask you, by your point of view, as the deforestation is such a big issue, uh, there is the risk that companies source from low deforestation areas or replace leather with other materials. Of course, there is, and, and we are seeing that uh, as well. And, uh, and I think there are two risks there. One, you can re replace leather for another material, and the other one, you can replace regions. You can replace the areas where you're sourcing from. And I if we look, both can be negative. Uh, we we know as a fact that beef production will continue. It will very likely to, to, to increase. So I think as a society, we need to find the best way of making the most of the materials that are available instead of uh, wasting those materials. When you think about deforestation, when you think about critical social and environmental issues, the worst thing that can happen is a company leave uh, a specific region to avoid that problem. This is something we, we are talking every day with brands, with tanneries. If you are leaving that space, if you are responsible, if you have high standards and you are leaving that space, you're going to create a void. And that void is going to be taken by somebody else. What happens is that many times, I I if you a company with high standards is leaving, the chance that somebody with a lower standard will come. And then we lose the opportunity to, to fix, we lose the, the, the opportunity to address. So if, we, if I can make a suggestion, I, if I can make a recommendation, don't change the, the, the areas you, you are sourcing from because of issues such as deforestation. Engage with the problem engage with the many organizations and WWF is not the only one, but be a part of the solution. If you 
leave our area just to 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 ignore that problem or to leave i understand y you are avoiding risk which is important but uh, you won't be part of the solution if you are doing that okay earl so you i can guess you don't want to quit brazilian leather but supporting wwf which is the biggest achievement you think you can uh, achieve I guess just to clarify the the first part of that on on the Brazilian leather, can you repeat that? Yeah, it was a joke. You don't want to quit Brazilian leather. Oh, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Sorry, I, I I didn't catch that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think Fernando covered it. We very much see um our role in this continuing to to commit to South American and Brazilian leather. We are we are not looking to to cut and run. Um, I think the the opportunity we see is to be that partner that. Um, helps sort of spark the, the acceleration of a deforestation and conversion-free um, standard. Uh, and I think that, that there, there really are two paths. There, there are businesses who may look at this and say that the risk is too high, but um, then the, that leverage from being present in the conversation, from being at the table, from trying to drive change sort of evaporates out of the situation. As Fernando touched on, that 80% of of leather being um, exported provides a huge um, point of leverage for the folks in the room here that are brands or that are suppliers sourcing from South America and Brazil in particular. Okay, question, we have one question. Okay, how can you successfully uh, prove, uh, trace uh, that soy or other agricultural product uh, linked to deforestation are not used uh, to feed uh, the cattle from which uh, you source the skin, because tracing to that level is not easy. Are you specifically finding solution and uh, advice for that? Thanks. I think it's, yeah. I, I think it's a very good question, and uh, there are different ways of answering it to you. First, in terms of when you look at technology, there are plenty of solutions to to, to trace materials, to monitor suppliers. So, it's not a traceability, uh, it's not a technology issue to to create that transparency. The most important part is about market arrangements. It's how you can connect it, connect all the stakeholders to, to, to receive the information you need. Some We see that in some areas this is easier, other areas are, are more complicated. If you think about South America, for example, in Brazil you can, uh, to trace and to monitor direct suppliers of, of slaughterhouses, it's, uh, it's not complicated. I, w I was going to say simple, but it's not simple, but it's not complicated. But if you want to monitor indirect that we must, we need because a lot of the problems goes to indirect suppliers. There is technology, but you have even laws that protect, protect confidentiality. So you need to, to have volunteer participation from, from stakeholders to, to share that information. For, for doing that, you, you gotta, you gotta create mechanisms, you, you got to incentivize those practices. Sometimes we need to think even about um, paying for, 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 for more information, paying for traceability. A and some of those questions, how to do it, we don't have it yet. But if we don't start that journey, we will not have those answers. We, from the pilots we are doing right now, we have four different project, five projects in South America where we, wh we identified the tools we identif we we are working with some incentive mechanisms and we are testing to see what works better what doesn't 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 work so well after that also we're going to try to to fill the gaps but i i, I think that the the most clear answer to that is that we need to sort the, the market arrangements the relationships more than than the technology Someone else? Uh, hello, thank you very much for this. Uh, this is more of a question for uh, Earl, I believe. 
uh, as a luxury ha uh, fashion house, uh, I'm wondering if this quest to sustainability and traceability is coming um, just of your out of your own initiative as a as a brand, or uh, is it coming from your customers? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, and there, there's not just one motivating factor. I, I mentioned a couple. Um, certainly, there's been a great deal of media coverage around deforestation uh, as maybe even just a subpart of climate change, right? It, as, as Fernando mentioned, this is a huge sort of um, hot topic that, that is, is getting a lot of it of due attention. So there's, there's the media, there's the regulatory, there's our own ambitions as a brand, our commitments to science-based targets. Um, we just feel like this is a direction we've got to go and we know across our um, different opportunities or challenges out there that this is one that that stands to be quite impactful um, so it's it, it's not a single factor in it and i should also mention it's not the only thing we're working on um, there are a number of tactics and strategies that we're pursuing as part of trying to reduce our environmental impact as an organization um, across scope one, two, and three. We just know that this is such a big opportunity that it's one we don't want to miss. Okay, so please an applause to our guests. Thank you, Thank you a lot, Fernando. Thank you a lot, Earl. So from Brazil to Paraguay, uh, here we have Lorenzo Nalin. His charge is not easy because he is program manager, component of the Al Invest Verde European Union program, and works at the Italo Latin American International Organization. It's true? It's true. <laughs> I'm not lying. <laughs> he is cooperating with uh, Matteo Vercruz of Matelli uh, at the definition of sustainable strategies in the Paraguayan leather sector to export in the European Union. Uh, can you explain us which is the situation in Paraguay and uh, what, what th which is the field of your, of your work? Okay, uh, so I will start to answer this question, first of all, by introducing a little bit of what we do and then uh, going into more details about our Paraguayan experience. And I will let Matthew uh, provide more, more details for that. So uh, as you mentioned, understanding my role is a, bit, a little bit complex in the sense that I uh, work as a program manager for a European Union uh, cooperation program, which is called Al Invest Verde. But I'm not from European Union. I'm working for a international organization that is called ILA, Italo Latin American Organization, uh, which is uh, formed by 24 uh, better? Oh, apologize. So, so, so I was saying that um, the ILA, where uh, I work, is an international organization uh, created by 24 Latin American countries plus Italy. And so we uh, receive um, some funding from the European Commission in order to implement some uh, strategic program for the Commission. One of those programs is the Alinvest uh, Verde program. Um, which is um, developed by us and our partner FIAP, an agency uh, for development uh, of the Spanish government. And uh, I'm here today to uh, a little bit uh, providing some information about what we do as a Alinvest Verde, because uh, we're working in different states in, in South America and on different projects. So maybe uh, it could be uh, helpful to uh, share what we are doing in order to find some uh, common um, goals uh, and, and projects uh, because we're working a lot with the private sector and uh, also of course I will explain a little bit of the context why we are doing what we're doing and then I will uh, as I was saying uh, giving the floor to Matthew to speak about the Paraguayan case study that we are uh, presenting today. So the, the program is uh, based on three components. Uh, one uh, is uh, based on the investment project uh, for companies in Latin America in order to provide resources for a uh, transition to a low carbon production system. Another part of uh, the uh, program works in improving intellectual properties. And, but uh, the reason why I'm here today is to talk about component two where I work which is uh, basically offering and working 
uh, on technical assistance to the public sector in Latin American countries. And specifically, we are working in Brazil, Argentina, uh, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And uh, we are also working with Colombia, but for other um, commodities uh, like coffee. Uh, so I, I guess the context uh, why uh, we're working in Latin America is not secret for you, but just to remind us or to provide more complementary information to the previous um, presentation, uh, uh, we, we know very well that the um, growth engine of Latin American countries has been the export of commodities. And we can see that from the 60s, towards our days, uh, basically all the products from uh, agriculture, uh, meat, cereals, have been uh, increasing at the exponential rate. And clearly, uh, to export more, you have to produce more, of course, and also production has increased exponentially. But this implies that there is a um, great pressure on, on, on the land, and uh, this leads to uh, deforestation. So the uh, idea to present this data is to uh, provide a clear link between uh, trade and between the pressure that we have uh, on, on, on forest land. Um, but uh, nowadays things are changing because um, the main uh, consumer of those raw materials are becoming more aware that uh, consuming in an unsustainable way or buying unsustainable products uh, is not um, sustainable over the, long, over the long run and is a huge problem for climate change. And by having uh, done this uh, introduction, by providing this context, uh, I, I'm, I'm not here to say that um, the cause of climate change are Latin American countries. Of, of course, they're, they're not uh, the great the greatest contributor polluters are not those countries. But still, if we are, if we are working towards a unique goal, which is being uh, carbon neutral by uh, some date between 2050 and 2060, depending on the region, uh, of course, we cannot uh, do the mistake of uh, decreasing uh, emission in polluters countries while uh, not intervening in the production, uh, production system of emerging economies. So the reason uh, programs such as Al Invest Verde have been created is to use trade as a tool uh, for sustainability. And as I was saying, things are uh, more or less changing in the world, and in particular in the uh, European Union, in the sense that since 2020, the European uh, Green uh, New Deal has put forward some line of works, uh, some strategy for being more carbon neutral and for being more sustainable. And among those um, initiatives, uh, uh, I guess we are very uh, aware of the deforestation free supply chain regulation, which, is, uh, which has been just approved in December 2022. And so the basis of our work is to uh, help from a public uh, policy uh, focus uh, the um, countries of Latin America in implementing uh, strategies to adopt the new regulation and to still uh, have a, a trade flows with the European Union but respecting all these new standards. Uh, we are working uh, basically through two tools. One is of course intervening directing with policy and regulatory frameworks and, and, and providing technical assistance to, to governments. And the other one is, to, um, uh, is by implementing uh, dialogues, regional dialogues on the uh, role of the new regulation and the importance to adapt to this new um, framework. And dialogue may, might seem a uh, basic tool to work, something really simple, not really efficient. But when you uh, start to engage with the private sector and the public sector, uh, most of the time you will find that uh, implementing uh, the regulation in Latin America, it's uh, complicated because the systems uh, should be adapted and should be, first of all, known and not all the times uh, uh, those the new regulation are known, so by implementing dialogues we 
have been uh, able to engage many stakeholders and, uh, and, to, and to promote more sustainable value chain. So just to um, present some initiative uh, we have done uh, before getting into the Paraguayan case, uh, we developed throughout the, the 2021 and, tw and 22 a dialogue with Brazil stakeholders for the sustainability of the leather and, um, and, and beef production. And many stakeholders are here today and thank you for participating to those dialogues. The initiative has provided us some interesting public policy conclusion. And one of those is that traceability is nowadays a tool for uh, trade. It was a tool of trade when we faced the med cow problem back in the times, and it's now a new uh, tool for trade uh, when we think about the implementation of the regulation. And working from the, public, uh, the private sector uh, perspective and with the public, uh, public sector, uh, I think, or we think, uh, that uh, a public traceability system in experiences such as uh, Paraguay, it's uh, really uh, what is needed because we experience uh, some, we encounter some uh, policy recommendation from our stakeholders that are trying to implement in, uh, only private um, traceability initiatives. And one of, um, um, among those uh, problems that we, 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 uh, we encounter is that when you're implementing a private traceability initiative, you are facing the problem of adverse selection. So basically you have to trust the information you received, but uh, you, do, you cannot enforce any type of uh, law in order to check if the information is, is, is reliable, right? It's an act of uh, trusting uh, your, your clients or your provider. And then, uh, as a company, as a private company, you have a limited access uh, to, to, do, to data. So you cannot know all the market. You will, of course, know only the segment of the market you are involved with. And also, monetary indirect supply is not always uh, simple. And even if you are, have the best uh, traceability system, you, you can still face some reputational risk, such as cattle laundering, the fact that uh, maybe at some point in the chain, uh, cattle coming from a deforested land entered the chain and you cannot monitor that. And so improving the, trans the transparency is uh, the main goal of having uh, tr a public trustability systems. And we have been working um, with Brazil in trying uh, to do a uh, public trustability system. And I'm mentioning all of this because uh, when we'll present the case, when Matthew present the case of Paraguay, uh, the final uh, goal, the aim of that project is to go towards this kind of system, the Seio Verde system. Uh, Seio Verde is a platform in the state of Pará. Pará is one of the most ex beef exporters in Brazil. And it's a public free of charge uh, platform implemented by University of Minas Gerais in collaboration with the state of Pará. And what we are doing now is expanding uh, uh, this system uh, into the state of Minas Gerais. And the reason we're doing it is because if when you look at the Brazilian market and the trustability initiative there, you will find 14 different trustability initiatives, most of them uh, done at the private level. So when you are a buyer here in Europe and you go to Brazil and you buy, you will have to study 14 different systems with 14 different standards. But by having a public free of charge um, trustability system, most of the um, transition costs, the due diligence uh, costs are uh, reduced. So um, here in this, uh, in this platform, uh, what is easy for the final user is that you can uh, basically use the um, land registry of your clients. You go to the web page, you put the land numbers in, into, the, uh, into the platform and you will get a seal, uh, the Seio Verde. You will get uh, a, a color uh, which goes from uh, red to green, uh, passing through uh, orange, and each color is associated with the risk that you are encountering by doing business with uh, that specific client. And 
the um, good things about having uh, this, this system is not that you can uh, check the direct uh, provider, but you can also work with indirect providers. And so you can uh, actually understand if there is a risk of a repetitional risk by doing this uh, business with one person, with one company, not because that company is doing deforestation, but maybe because the animals are coming from regions where deforestation has been done. So, um, uh, again, so I, I presented all of this because this is uh, what we believe uh, it could be war it could be working for Paraguay. And I'm saying this because the uh, Para region has more or less, and also the Minas Gerais region state, uh, has more or less the same uh, number of the stock, stock of cattle and dimension and population uh, compared to Paraguay. So it's... Uh, it, it's, it, it's, um, it, it is possible to implement in the same system. Uh, of course, in Brazil, uh, it's much more difficult to have the central state implementing one system for all the land that should be covered, but in Paraguay, it's possible. So, finally, I'm answering your question after a long introduction. So, why we're working in Paraguay and what we're doing in Paraguay? So, we've been... Uh, the, the Ministry of Industry and Commerce in Paraguay contacted us uh, for a technical assistance uh, to uh, help recovering the exports of the leather sector. Um, since uh, 2014, the industry has suffered uh, a decrease in the uh, export volumes, especially uh, those uh, imports from Italy. And so the idea is to, um, to, to, to help them finding a strategy to recover the market. But of course, that strategy has to be uh, done uh, only through um, traceability. Uh, of course, the, the, the um, um, regulation now is, is binding everyone, especially countries such as uh, Paraguay that are heavily reliant on commodities. And so we um, start uh, this project in uh, December, and we have uh, been in talk uh, with uh, UNICH, with COTANS, and with ICHEC. So thank you for your uh, wonderful uh, advices. And among um, those advices, we uh, have the um, suggestion to start to work with Matelli and, and with Matthew. And we uh, started in December. We went to Paraguay, to, to the Grand Chaco region. Uh, a small advice, if you're planning to go to Grand Chaco, which is a wonderful place, don't go in December because it, it's really hot, it's 45 degrees. But despite the weather, we, we went there and we did uh, interviews with all the stakeholders in the region to understand more about the market, to understand more about how production is done and to understand more how trustability uh, could be implemented and could be uh, developed in such a way that uh, also social environmental standards are part of the traceability system they are using. So uh, with no further words, I, I would let uh, Matthew present in some of the preliminary results. Again, we have been uh, just starting, so uh, the project is going on for six months, uh, and then um, uh, we will start from the findings of this consultancy, and we'll uh, hopefully implement and more, more, more policy on that. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, um, as Lorenzo mentioned, basically uh, most of the leather produced in Paraguay has been imported by Italy in the past years. And so the reduction of this import from Italy created a huge problem. Main reason for this is the lack of trust of the traceability systems in Paraguay and the implications and risk of deforestation which may occur importing hides from Paraguay and inserting them into one supply chains. So what, do, what was our objective? We had to find a way to first understand the current traceability systems in Paraguay and then understand the current measures which are being taken in Paraguay to try and help mitigate or guarantee that there is no illegal deforestation occurring at the moment, or that the direction is to improve that. 
initially we start most of the meetings at the beginning were with the in institutional uh, government offices starting with Sinaxa, which is the veterinary system there in Paraguay where all animals registered or live in the which are sold in the country have to be registered with a veterinary system the, this veterinary system has uh, its own group traceability system called SIGUR. This SIGUR basically is a system of approval of all farmers and cattle breeders on the country who need to be registered in order to... Sorry, not a great public speaker. Um, to it's to create a group traceability system. This is to guarantee the health and safety of the consumption of beef within the Paraguayan uh, country. Since then, there has been an another um, system developed, which is an individual traceability system. This is used in order to sell the beef produced in Paraguay into the European Union, which has been asking for a more, uh, more specific traceability system uh, more similar to the one that we have here in Italy or here in Europe. As I said, all animals in Paraguay need to be registered to Sigur and to Senaxa, which, um, which is mandatory for everyone and it's a group traceability and it's simple to apply to this system. Farmers who, uh, who apply and are a part of this only need to use their IDs, their registered, uh, register their firebrands. Sorry, thank you. Sorry again. Um, but obviously this group traceability system which has been implied or applied up until now has not been successful in proving uh, sorry So where were we? <laughs> uh, again, so basically just to sum up, there are two systems in Paraguay, and one is the no, no, and one is a group traceability a, a traceability system that uh, is a group traceability system, and the other one is individual. It's called CTRAP. This CTRAP is um, used only for Europe export to the European Union. It's a system negotiated by the Commission and the government of Paraguay. And if you want to export to Europe, you have to be in that system. And the uh, difference uh, with the other system concerns the health um, issues that uh, you are tracking with that system. Not only the uh, individual animal, but also there are requirements for all the uh, pharmaceutical products applied to the animal. But um, given the fact that um, the uh, trade of beef uh, from Paraguay uh, to the world is basically done uh, towards Israel, towards Chile. Uh, it used to be uh, towards um, Russia, but now is shifting, of course, for obvious reasons. Uh, given all these uh, flows, uh, the CTROP system is only used, the European one is only used by less than 10%. And so basically there is no individual traceability uh, system applied in, 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 in Paraguay. And then uh, one of the um, first uh, goals of our program there is to bust the people, the, the, the farmers to go into the uh, individual system because uh, with a individual trustability system you can have much more control over the chain and you can solve one of the problem I was mentioning before which is the indirect supplying. Uh, the, uh, checking the whole chain and not only the last point of the chain. Um, so I will uh, skip a little bit. This is uh, a um, technical information about uh, 
in the system, but what is important is uh, it is possible to implement a social environmental traceability system in Paraguay because they already have geo-referential systems that are uh, checking uh, the problem of deforestation. So there is a public institution, uh, the Institute of Forest, uh, uh, Instituto Nacional de Forestas, I apologize, I cannot translate in English, but again, they have the system, they have the data, and they also uh, um, count on um, georeferential uh, technology. And besides of that, you have also the Ministry of the Environment who is giving permission if you want to uh, have a, um, a cattle uh, activity, uh, you have to ask permission to the Ministry of the uh, Environmental. So my point is, if you look at all different institutions, there is that there exists data to implement a traceability initiative, and it's possible to check if the animal is coming from a deforested land. So, uh, so I will uh, skip to the conclusion because uh, what I've just said uh, it should be a great news, but uh, one of the problems we uh, found uh, at least we believe there is when we are uh, trying to set up a trustability system for uh, the uh, for environmental purposes is governance we've been talking with the ministry of um, commerce and the uh, industry and commerce we've been talking with all the actors uh, uh, the um, uh, responsible for CTRAP, uh, with the responsible for the forest agency. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, no one knows uh, who should be responsible for that traceability initiative. And there are some jealousies between uh, some uh, public players. So governance here is fundamental because you're mixing a lot of databases and you have to uh, be coordinated. And um, um, and this is th the problem of governance uh, would be even uh, bigger this year because it is an election year. So in April you will be election and most of the actors now they don't want to um, expose themselves to take the responsibility to implement a traceability system at least the new government is formed. So a, a first concern that we have uh, we uh, think there is uh, after our mission is uh, governance, governance indeed. And then another interesting thing, when we were talking with farmers, when we were interviewing all the players, they always ask us about money. How much are you paying me for being in a trustability system that also uh, can provide uh, environmental information? And it's uh, tough to explain that it's not about paying you more. It's about to stay in the market because global trends are going in a clear direction. And also, if you look at the, uh, from a public policy um, focus, uh, it's tough to, for the Paraguayan government to offer the private sector, the, 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 the beef private sector, more incentive because they almost don't pay taxes and they are one of the most uh, profitable businesses in Latin America if compared, for example, to a neighborhood called Argentina that uh, have taxes for uh, all type of activities. So it's uh, tough to provide more economic incentives or reducing taxes to a sector that is already part of the inequality problem. I would also say that one of the problems we uh, found there is the lack of collaboration between tanneries and slaughterhouses. And I guess I'm touching a point where uh, all of you is, uh, is facing today. Um, so when you talk with multinational companies, especially those from Brazil, uh, they already have their systems uh, operating in Paraguay, of course. They have their system and they have a kind of uh, cooperation uh, in place between the slaughterhouse and the tannery. But when you talk uh, with uh, Paraguayan tanneries, most of the time uh, the slaughterhouse is, is providing only the um, legal requirements without providing more data. So if you want to go up in the chain is kind of impossible. Um, again, uh, even those that those tanneries that are benefiting from being uh, a multinational companies or incorporated in a multinational companies, uh, as I was saying before, they are able right now to monitor only direct suppliers. So again, the problem of um, 
avoid scandals or trace all the chain cannot be solved right now. And as I was mentioning again uh, before, dialogue is important here because we found with many players a lot of skepticism uh, when we were mentioning about the possibility of expanding the traceability system uh, towards a more uh, environmentally friendly measurement. And most of them, uh, they comply that they are already doing all the bureaucracy they are required by law and they don't want to do the extra effort. So in order to have the private sector on board, which is fundamental, especially farmers, uh, there, uh, there is a need to still have a dialogue with, with the sector and, and still promote this idea that sustainability is business, is not a fancy uh, trend right now. And just to conclude, the idea, the long-term uh, objective is to uh, have a, a, a training session with Paraguayan authorities and with the private sector, at least the small players, to um, have them knowing that solutions are possible. In neighborhood countries such as Brazil, there are many initiatives that uh, are offering economic incentives or are providing public traceability system with no costs for the sector. And those systems are, have, been pro uh, have, have proved to work. So uh, one objective is uh, increasing public knowledge about those, those systems. And then uh, to... Um, Another, another goal is to uh, start a pilot project with the government in order to start to export deforestation-free uh, containers. We were talking this morning with some, uh, with some of you about how important it is to uh, transform this initiative, which is great from the sustainability uh, point of view, but should be reflected in trade, should be reflected in a more volume of trade and hopefully with the new government will be able to set up the first uh, deforestation free containers based on the traceability system that will be chosen by the new administration. And uh, clearly the reason why we're here is because we need you. We need within the, the, the European uh, private sector to be on board on this. So if uh, you have ideas, suggestions, recommendations, uh, it's, it's, it's for us vital to be feedback by your ideas and, and and yeah, that, that, that's all, and thank you very much for, for your attention. There are questions? I just say one, Lorenzo. Just one. Just one. Of course. Uh, by your point of view, yeah. by your experience, those are good or bad premises for the project? Because on a, on a side, the government is uh, well oriented. Uh, they want to recover the export leavets, but on the other hand, uh, someone doesn't want to cover it. They are jealous of the or their activities. It's a good or a bad context. Uh, so, what is good, in my opinion, is that there is a huge pressure from the leather private industry on the government to do something for the market. Uh, so, it's coming from the private sector, and the government is. Uh, noticing it and, and doing something for it, which is, in my experience with public policy, much more efficient to start with the demand from the private sector rather than being the public sector imposing something on the uh, private one. Uh, the starting point is, is presents some challenges and the one I mentioned, and hopefully with the new administration we can uh, keep the work we have been doing. Uh, again, uh, there, are data, there, there is data, there is the public uh, will to do something. Uh, what we need on board, who we need on board is the uh, farmer, uh, slaughterhouses, and, then, and that's why I was uh, em em emphasizing on the importance of keep the dialogue open and transmit to them the idea that uh, having a proper traceability system is good for trade. has been proved by uh, other experiences, has been proved from neighbor countries, and, and, and it will. Okay, so thank you, good luck and good job. An applause, please. Ah, no, we have a question. We have a question from we the have audience. A question. If uh, I understood well, uh, you are basing your approach
approach on the public sector role for bringing all stakeholders involved in the process. But historically, in Latin America, political reason or corruption is, uh, effects uh, affect the public sector. How are you addressing that kind of risk in order to prove uh, to all organizations uh, that uh, are using satellite data and so on uh, to counterfact uh, uh, public statement uh, that uh, all the data that uh, you are providing is uh, reliable and uh, trustable? Thank you. Sure. Uh, so I was mentioning before the Seio Verde project in Brazil, and we are uh, working to uh, use uh, the georeferenciation from the European Union, which is Copernicus. So we are double checking this system with our data. And that's, uh, I think, a, a way to uh, move the conversation on a technical issue. So if your data is good with mine, it's the same as mine, uh, I think we're good. But the concern you're raising is, of course, uh, uh, well noticed in, in the region. The, the, the main indicators uh, are worrisome somehow. And uh, in my opinion, the uh, good thing here is that we are working with universities and we are working on, te on a technical level. So it's, it's difficult to, uh, you know, uh, corrupt the satellite. <laughs> It could be easier to corrupt the moving of uh, the, 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 uh, the trade of animals within the countries. That, that's, that's correct. But uh, we, we, we do our best. <laughs>
of many of these uh, uh, impacts that are happening and in, in the climate. The EU is a driver of deforestation by its consumption, by using its market for selling the products that are uh, being uh, produced in, in high-risk countries. And uh, so the objective of the European Union is actually to minimize deforestation, to minimize the loss of uh, forest, uh, uh, pr primary forests in the, in the world, not only in, in Latin America, but globally, throughout the world, in any place. And there, is, there are lots of tropical climate zones that are uh, concerned. So we should not only focalize only on one country or on one region of the world, but we should look at this from a holistic perspective. So, not only wants the Commission to curb down deforestation, but it wants that uh, the EU market is not being used for selling products that are linked, that are associated with deforestation and forest degradation. So, now let's come to the what. What is going to happen? How is this going to be made? And um, the European Commission has had an idea um, to use due diligence for implementing what regulators or what uh, uh, politicians have not been able to do in, within their, in their practices. Uh, normally, we should not have deforestation. Why do we have deforestation? It's with because there is a political failure to hold that. And the European Union wants now that everybody is concerned with this issue and that also, the supply chains are acting on avoiding that these risks of deforestation actually happen. But uh, the European anti-deforestation rules are not only looking at deforestation and forest degradation, they are also looking at the, this, the imports, the commodities that are going to be associated with deforestation are actually legal. And that involves not only uh, the, the rules of the country where these uh, commodities are produced, but also the uh, commitments that these countries have taken when uh, in international fora. For instance, also human rights or the uh, indigenous rights, the, the rights of indigenous populations. So, um, deforestation, well, there is one important key point that needs to be taken into consideration is as of when do we have to look at deforestation and there is in the in the legislation the consideration of the cutoff date that is the uh, 31st December 2020 as of that date there shouldn't be any deforestation any longer because deforestation also Europe, Europe has has practiced deforestation. The whole, the whole continent was a forest and, and uh, in the past and historically we have deforested, de deforested the European uh, continent. But now, in order to be practical, uh, the European Union has chosen this cutoff date also because this date allows traceability. This date allows that uh, the use of informatic systems in order to see that uh, uh, whether we are actually enforcing the anti-deforestation rules. And for that, we need strict traceability. And strict traceability means that we have to be able to associate the commodities that are concerned by the EU anti-deforestation rules to the plot of land where they are originating, where they have been originating. So it's very important that we understand that uh, we need to be able to trace back to the plot of land uh, where, where these uh, uh, commodities come from. And there are a number of commodities among which, why I'm here, this, this is why I'm talking, among which also leather. Leather is considered as a derived product from the cattle system. There is cattle, of course, but there is also meat and, as a derived product, also the leather. Hides and skins and leather. Now, when is all this going to happen? Uh, when is this going to be entering into force or entering into application? 
uh, here you see a number of dates, and they they are uh, divided into two parts: the preparatory phase, and here this is started in November 2021, and then now when, as from now, when it is going to happen, when the the text was agreed by the. Uh, Council of the European Union, the European Parliament, and the European Commission, which is called in trialogue, uh, that happened in December last year. That's really a couple of months ago. Um, the <laughs> interesting is that this is one of the EU regulations that have been pushed through the system of the regulatory system with a speed that has been that is unprecedented so it has been really a very fast process so fast that even some well, maybe one <laughs> of the concerned parties one of the stakeholders which is the leather industry has not even been consulted or been uh, approached to ask them whether they are concerned or not they have not even been uh, we have not even been uh, uh, looked at in the impact assessment that uh, is uh, normally mandatory when uh, such a type of legislation is, is applied. But well, um, anyway, we are now here, leather is in the, in the deforestation, anti-deforestation regulation, and uh, um, it is going to be entering into force this year, in 2023. And, we need, and the European Commission needs to use this 2023 until 2000, the end of 2024 to actually make everything happen, putting everything in place in order to be applicable. So, how? That is the big question. As I said, <coughs> we need to, to look at it from a due diligence angle. Due diligence is the, the, the tool that the European Union has chosen in order to implement uh, anti-deforestation rules, in order to avoid that deforestation actually happens by a number of commodities, including leather. And for that uh, to happen, there is, an, there is a need to understand a number of things. For instance, from what countries? What are the risks that uh, uh, is, are associated with the countries for that? Uh, there is going to be a benchmarking system that is going to be implemented that is going to associate to every country where there is a risk of uh, 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 deforestation with a risk factor. There are going to be countries with a high risk, uh, countries with low risk, and countries with medium risk, of course, <laughs> because not all have this uh, uh, problem as, a, as a mon one of the core issues in their in their governance but um, for a start everybody is going to to start uh, with a default uh, consideration of uh, a high risk so uh, you need to prove that you as a country that uh, your risk is actually lower than what is the, the default um, geolocation well it's clear that for finding a solution, you need to be able to use some techniques, for instance, th that can be compatible with also with the satellite system that is going to be help you to, to, to define whether you are uh, acting in a supply chain that is affected with deforestation. And there are polygons that are going to be made are going to be very helpful, and they are mandatory above a certain uh, level. And in order to make all these things happen, uh, since due diligence is to be implemented by a paper system, you need to use a declaration, uh, you need to put in your, your responsibility into a declaration. This needs to be managed by an informatic system, a system whereby every commodity even complex commodities, even batches, even containers that have many, many of these commodities, actually can relate uh, to this paper system, and that this paper system gets through the old, the first to the competent authorities, to customs authorities, but also to the to the customers, and actually to 
to those who are going to be selling the products to the consumers. So that is an informatic system that is going to be very, very heavy and very difficult to manage. But the European Commission has already some experience in that because uh, it is these anti-deforestation rules are based on a previous act of the European Commission, of the European Union, pardon, excuse me, um, that was the timber regulation. And the timber regulation had already due diligence and therefore there is a, an antecedent, there is a, a, a precedent for for that and with a little bit of uh, success, of chance, th th it's going to be a success. Um, the fact uh, that there are uh, different risk status for the different countries is also um, something that will guide the countries, the competent authorities in the different countries with regard to the inspections, to the, to the controls. The um, high risk countries, when you buy commodities from high-risk countries, you will have a 9% chance to be controlled because authorities will have to control 9% of all the imports if they come from high-risk countries. If they come from low-risk countries, only 1% of all the imports are going to be controlled. In the medium case, in the case of a medium-risk country, it's going to be 3%. So. This due diligence and the, the is also applied by the competent authorities in the different countries that are going to apply and enforce this regulation. Um, I think we, we need to be looking here also a little bit at the legal certainty because as business people you are all concerned whether you are going to be falling into a reputational risk or not. But uh, there are a number of concepts here, like due diligence, like transparency, like traceability, and uh, um, there, needs, there needs a little bit more precision about what this is. And uh, um, we will see how we can manage this, uh, these uh, uh, very confusing uh, concepts that are being used in this deforestation, anti-deforestation regulation. Now, um, as, you can, as you can imagine, this uh, uh, European legislation is going to affect all countries. Not o it's going to be implemented not only in the European Union, it's going to be implemented also in the rest of the world. And uh, it, it has something to do with the extraterritorial ter application of EU legislation. That's a very complex system, uh, concept. But uh, that means that actually the European Union is legislating beyond its own boundaries. It is actually putting in place systems of governance that other countries have to implement and other countries have to enforce. Well, that's not so easy <laughs> because uh, uh, your authority ends at your borders. But if you want other countries to implement what you want, you need to use, uh, I would call it, sustainability diplomacy. And this, in this sustainability diplomacy, there are a number of elements or a number of uh, institutions that are cooperating, among which also I'll invest, and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm very happy that we have uh, uh, the possibility to engage with Al Invest in order to, to find solutions for those that are concerned. It's easier in smaller countries like Paraguay than in larger countries like Brazil. Um, so here we are, what do we have more? There are also other initiatives like the Cocoa Dialogue or the CAMI project, which I don't know, and the Forest Partnership. So there are a number of entities that are going to be used for uh, uh, facilitating the uh, application, the implementation of these anti-deforestation rules, among which also the, uh, the dialogue between uh, the, the, the civil dialogue between the, uh, the different countries um, that are going to have uh, to, to, to apply this legislation. Um, in order to find solutions to these 
lack, this ambiguity of the concepts, due diligence, traceability, certification, trust, etc., and all these, there are going to be a number of uh, guidance that are going to be developed. And these guidance are going to be developed in partnership with the stakeholders that are meeting in something that is called the deforestation platform of the European Commission. Cotons is part of this deforestation platform. And actually one of the things that we have done is that um, we, are, we have uh, agreed with uh, our partners from the meat industry in the European Union and the food and feed uh, sector, as well as the meat processors in Europe. These are UECBV for the slaughterhouses, the Copaco Jeka for the food and feed uh, sector, and uh, Klitravi for the meat processors, into a, a working group in order to find what are the instruments in order to communicate between the various links of the supply chain. Of course, we are doing it for the European Union because also the meat sector in the European Union is going to have to comply with these rules and therefore to provide this due diligence statement that, uh, that needs to be given. And there needs to be some other information that passes, that goes through the, through the, the supply chain. We have heard uh, that data are essential. Data is what you have to communicate in order to ensure that not only, uh, I would say, faith, uh, is used, but there is also trust, and trust must rely on something that is tangible. And tangible, and what is tangible here is the data. So, therefore, the communication, what data are going to be exchanged in the supply chain, is going to be um, discussed and agreed in these uh, uh, working groups that are going to flow into what is called these guidelines. Um, Fine. So, what's next? Uh, some challenges and some opportunities. Here I would like to, to, to draw the, the attention also on some other aspects that are really very relevant, particularly because um, for the time being, we don't have any traceability. We don't have really any traceability in the, in the supply chain of heights and skins. Not even in the European Union. Because although in the European Union you have these systems of ear tax that provide information, traceability information to the food sector, this is a distinct sector. The food that, that is based on sanitary and uh, um, health reasons, but the heights and skins are not in this food system. The heights and skins are a byproduct, and as a byproduct, even of very, very low value for the, for, the, for the meat sector, they don't have the right to this traceability system. So even in the European Union, this is now a big, big challenge. That is why we are sitting in the same working group with the meat industry in order to find a solution how to overcome this. We are in this, in this working, we, we, we are in a, in a dialogue with the meat sector uh, since 2019. As quotas, we we started with this with this before even the Commission started to work on uh, deforestation. But of course, the COVID situation has stopped this dialogue because we could not meet during the the during these these three years, these last three years. Anyway, so that is one one of the challenges. We need to find a solution of traceability for the industry for the supply chain. Otherwise, we are not going to be able to implement and to, to, to allow to prove conformity with this regulation. And that needs to happen very, very quickly, from now to the end of 2024. Second challenge. We have heard also from Fernando Belize, I think it was, that other countries, yes, you, you mentioned that the US, UK, are looking into deforestation, anti-deforestation rules. But well, that, that's fine, that's very good. Because that means that it's not only a EU issue. It is something that everybody is concerned. And indeed, the fact that uh, uh, these other countries are going to be developing some other rules is a good thing, but also a risk. Because what happens if these rules are not aligned? What happens if these rules leave some loopholes? for the trade. 
is this going to be a risk for deviation of trade? It is going to be a, is this going to be an opportunity for rogue traders? That's a risk. Finally, um, legal certainty and reputational risks. I think it's clear that unless all these concepts and the traceability is not really effective and understood, we are going to have legal uncertainty. And that is a situation that the business people in this room and in the fair cannot afford. So we need to step up our cooperation. We need to work together in order to find the solutions to this lack of definition of a number of concepts in order to have it right. Now, on the opportunities, <laughs> I think there are also some opportunities, and particularly some opportunities for, for certain uh, developing countries, because um, this, this is going to help developing countries to step up in the value addition. As you know, uh, the, uh, well, you may not know it, the, 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 the commodities that are concerned by this regulation end with leather. 4107, the, the Customs Commodity Code. What about cut components? What about footwear? What about leather goods? What about uh, leather interiors? What about all these other things that are maybe produced in other countries? Do they have to provide a due diligence statement? No. No. So the countries that are high risk countries may think well, if I cannot export any more my leather, I'm going to export cut components for my customers. Why not? I don't have that evades, escapes the, um, the due diligence uh, obligations. Well, it's, it's not very nice, but it's an opportunity. We, it's an opportunity, a business opportunity for all these people. So we need to, to be aware of that as well. Uh, it is, oh yes, I forgot <laughs> the most important, the opportunity is that this is going to be a really a driver of improvement of technology in our sector and in the leather sector and in the leather supply chain. This is really very important. We need to be able to, to find the technical tools in order to provide systematic information, informatic data exchange uh, uh, throughout the supply chain. Not only because of, def of deforestation, also for, for other reasons. Um, well, and finally, well, as I said, it's a, it's a driver of investment, it's a driver of highly va higher value added products. So these are the opportunities in these countries. But now, <laughs> allow me to come to my topic. I, I made this presentation of the EU anti deforestation rules because uh, the Commission did not uh, uh, want to, or was not available to come to this, uh, to this meeting. So now let me enter into my topic, which is the uh, initiative on alignment of leather traceability schemes. And uh, here um, I'd like to start talking that, uh, uh, of what you may have heard also here or in the, in the, in the workshop of this morning. That is um, the different EU legislations that are actually driving Making, making that traceability becomes something that is real. And that is, these are the regulations. You have seen it's the anti-deforestation uh, uh, regulation, the corporate sustainability reporting directive, which both uh, were initiated in 2021. You have the corporate sustainability due diligence uh, directive that is going to, to that started uh, last year the Sustainable Products Initiative, eco-design with the product, digital product passport, and uh, another one that uh, was launched this year, which is the Decent Work Regulation, that is going to look at uh, uh, forced labor, child labor, very important. These all require traceability in order to be implemented. That's very important. So it's not only the anti-deforestation regulation of the European Union that drives traceability, but also all these other regulations that are uh, that the European Union is actually putting in place and that is 
going to be a paradigm shift. We are no longer going to be thinking about our supply chains the same way. Everything has changed and we need to change our chip as well in order to be able to be in business, to remain in business also tomorrow and next year and in 10 years. So we need really to change our way to do business, to change our way to think about supply chains. Traceability. Well, <laughs> traceability is about tracing and tracking products back to their origin. And for doing that, it's better if we do that if following some standards and agreed guidelines. And uh, if we can also certify traceability, we should be looking that these certifications are aligned. And certification is what? Certification is a tool. Is a tool that we can use in order to produce trust in the supply chain. To produce trust for our customers. And that is the reason why certification is become so interesting here. And that is why we have been looking at certification as well. And we, we here you, you have a number of elements, a number of criteria that make certification a useful tool for the industry, particularly certification for traceability. Do we have guidelines? Do we have standards? Yes, there are some standards and guidelines that are in place. Uh, they have been developed for the textile industry, basically, for which uh, the leather industry or the, 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 the garments, the, the footwear sector has been added on. So they are necessarily large. They are necessarily uh, looking at it from a, from a higher perspective. Um, and these are those, the due diligence uh, guidelines that have been developed for, for, uh, for um, due diligence for the uh, garment and footwear sector and the UNESE uh, Transparency and Traceability Initiative uh, that, uh, are, uh, that, that has uh, also developed how this traceability could look like in textiles and leather value chains. And uh, um, however, the um, concepts that are expressed, as I said, in these two guidance documents are leaving a number of things open. They are not directly applicable. They need to be um, reduced to something that is then being applicable. And that is where we started to think of how can we engage, how can we improve, what, what can we do in order to facilitate that this implementation, that this enforcement of the regulation does not lead to a proliferation of different standards, a proliferation of different schemes that are that we have seen also in the past for 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 looking at um, chemical compliance to what our customers are asking for. That has led to to standards, different standards, and to a certain standard fatigue and to a certain audit fatigue. Companies in our sector, in the tanning sector, have been, have had to follow different standards and have had to follow also different audits. So that creates a lot of unproductive costs. This we would, we did not certainly want to see it repeated with traceability. That is why we thought that we should find a way to align the different schemes that the certification or uh, certification uh, owners or protocol owners were to put in place. And that is where we, we started to think, how are we going to be able to, to do that? This by bringing them all on the same table to negotiate, to discuss and negotiate 
how they could make sure that they can be mutually recognized, that they recognize that one recognize the scheme of another, and also how can we help also these certification scheme owners that uh, what they are doing could be eventually referenced by legislation for proving conformity with the legislation. That is standardization, official standardization, sense standardization. Coutance is part of the uh, standardization um, body, uh, SEN, and uh, we, are, we are managing the uh, technical committee 289, which is concerned we, with leather. So I mentioned also that we were engaging with the meat industry already in 2019 uh, with a dialogue with the sector. And uh, um, I mentioned also that we have um, get into, into a working group with the meat industry and uh, the food and feed sector, as well as with the meat processors in order to find solutions. So uh, I think, well, you see here all the certification uh, scheme owners that with which we are, with whom we are working, that is ICEC in Italy, the Leather Working Group, who does not need presentation, uh, the Sustainable Leather Foundation, uh, Ecotex, Textile Exchange, and we involved also in this table, around the table, the standard experts that are working in the SEN TC289. So that is the group, the core group of people who are coming together and have already decided on a terms of reference for which we have started this uh, in this Lina Belle Affair with the signature of uh, the terms of reference that we are going to apply. The, the body is being called leather, uh, leather traceability cluster to which we are going to be inviting progressively also uh, WWF, uh, NWF, uh, as well as the meat sector to join us from not only the Europeans, but also the US, uh, Australia, other countries that would like to engage with us into this, this process, into this journey to define the way we want to trace uh, uh, these commodities in order to be able to prove conformity with the legislation. For that, we need to find agreed solutions to a number of issues that I'm not going to enter into detail because I, I think I have entertained you already quite a lot. So uh, take a picture of this last slide and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gustavo. Wait a minute. Yes, 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 I take my class. Um, have you any question? Maybe one? No? <laughs> Gustavo, I'd like to clarify two topics. The first one is why the Commission included eyes and skin in the regulation if they are a byproduct? That's a good question. Uh, and uh, my, my answer is that I don't know. <laughs> I would like to know why they haven't uh, done that. Uh, I have some suspicious suspicions, but uh, uh, I don't have any certainty. So clearly, um, there is a lot of pressure from the, uh, in, in the media, uh, from certain activist organizations that want to, to put uh, uh, the leather industry to, to, to pay for something that is not their responsibility. Because if you look at the, what the, the tanning sector is doing, uh, I think it is closer to a recycling sector that uh, reuses uh, a residue of another sector and makes it a valuable product and uh, generates uh, wealth in, 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 in the world, actually. Um, and uh, I think that uh, um, this is something that uh, um, is not yet recognized, that this is not uh, sufficiently known and that uh, uh, animal activist uh, organizations try to minimize or, or to, 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 to avoid, to, to say, no, no, that's not true. So we need to, to handle also leather. There is, a, there is one of the reasons why leather is ended up in this regulation. The European Union is not a major meat importer. So if cattle 
is driving deforestation, if cattle is one of the um, a major sectors dri that drives deforestation, and the European Union does not import meat from, from this kind of marginal part, a small part, uh, the Hilton beef quota, etc. That's what uh, we are importing. So there is no, the European Union has no grasp on, on, on that part of the, of the sector. So therefore, the only thing that we, <laughs> that, that the European Union was importing were hides and skins and leather. I said, well, here we have the perfect product in order to drive, the dri un drive anti-deforestation by putting the leather industry into this, into this uh, um, proposal. But uh, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a wrong assessment because if you only include leather and not all the other products, the European Union is not going to be halting deforestation, even in the case that leather would be dri a driver of deforestation. Which is which it is not, but uh, uh, of course, leather can be imported in other countries, uh, transformed into products and sold into the European Union. And well, the European Union will not have achieved its goal. Okay, thank you. An applause to Gustavo. <laughs> now, as we are talking about certification. I am pleased to introduce you Sabrina Frontini, director of ICEC, Institute of Certification based in Milan. She can talk about the schemes of traceability certified by ICEC and most of all about its innovative tool of risk analysis on animal welfare. Please, Sabrina. Thank you, Roberto. Good afternoon to everyone and thank you for this opportunity to be here with you and share with you our experience on these issues of traceability and animal welfare uh, in, the in the leather supply chain. First of all, let's start about uh, the market needs, uh, about the consciousness of suppliers of the supply chain of purchase materials. This is all what the suppliers have to guarantee and uh, for sure certification can be a real instrument to do this uh, in a credible way. Uh, also because uh, self-declaration are no more accepted, so uh, everyone has to show and to demonstrate how they work on these issues through certification. And traceability is always requested by the suppliers and also by the brands. This is the reason why, uh, even if uh, leather is a byproduct of the food industry, uh, in 99% of cases, because when we speak about bovine animals, uh, sheep and goats and pigs, uh, this is a real and true sen sentence, uh, the supply chain uh, try to answer to these uh, kinds of requests. And uh, we try to give our services through traceability certification, for example, the uh, ICHEC TS 410 and 12 schemes support to do this kind of work. And through this kind of certification, tanneries can collect the names of countries and places of slaughtering and breeding of the animals, if they exist. And uh, so we can have the origin of the uh, letters purchased by the tanneries. And we, ver we verify this kind of data. Starting from this kind of information collected in 12 months of purchase order because we conduct uh, annual audit and so we every year we control 12 months of uh, purchase order. We can also do some improvement, some, uh, uh, we can apply some, to some tools. Uh, for example, we can do something uh, related to risk analysis on deforestation and this is the reason why we collaborated with uh, WWF, with NWF. Uh, we can do the ethical claim, so we can control that the tanneries recover their hides and skins from the food industry. And we can do also a risk analysis on animal welfare. This is a new tool created by, by ICEC and introduced the last year. And uh, now I'm here to introduce this tool to you. Let's consider that uh, starting from 1964, the condition of animal welfare was discussed and questioned. And uh, now we are always speaking about the main five freedoms of the animal welfare related to hunger, thirst, uh, discomfort, and so on. You know, <laughs> I suppose all these issues. 
and animal welfare and sustainability topics uh, are more and more connected because we have always uh, to, to think about a world where animal welfare and the humans and environment are strictly connected and also the United Nations are moving in this uh, uh, kind of uh, direction because also the SDGs, uh, the UN Environmental Programme uh, are working uh, to enforce uh, this connection between humans, animals and ecosystem. But let's go back to our tool and uh, because I am here to describe how it works. We start con collecting the information through traceability schemes, uh, through, so, so through Excel map, uh, each XTS 410 and 12. We don't need to do additional audit uh, to do this kind of risk analysis. And we can also uh, do this kind of work after each, after each traceability audit. So each uh, year we can do this work, adding a risk analysis to the traceability certification. We can do this work uh, with internal people and also with animal welfare external specialists because we are supported by the Veterinary University of uh, Milan. And uh, we do this kind of work according to a pre-established and mathematical tool. Uh, doing this kind of work, uh, we have created a database. We are the owner of this database, which includes uh, not only laws applied in the countries of origin of the animals, but also the voluntary protocols that we find uh, during this kind of analysis. All the requirements are uh, specified in the tools, so we consider laws, voluntary certification, best practice uh, on farming, slaughtering, and transport of the animals. This kind of tool, uh, I want to underline, that is applicable for bovine, for goats, and for sheep leather. In this moment, it is not appli applicable to uh, other kinds of leather. But the final result, it's important to under underline that is customized because uh, we have uh, uh, a weighted final rating depending uh, on the annual purchase made by the tannery. So we will have a risk analysis with a final rating with a score of uh, uh, 100 points uh, that identifies the risk and the opportunities of improvement. Uh, when we buy leather, this risk analysis is not the only factor that we have to consider because for sure we have to consider also the prices, the availabilities, the qualities of the leather. But uh, for sure, mm, this kind of work can help uh, tanneries to manage risk and to, to, to support, to be more transparent with their stakeholders. How it works, this tool? We have uh, a first level based on regulatory framework on animal welfare of the countries of origin. And the second level based on voluntary certification schemes uh, applied by specific slaughterhouses and farmers. How we collect the information. This is the, an example of our Excel map uh, through which we collect all the names and places of slaughtering and farming of the animals uh, in which we have added uh, some new column through which we can push the suppliers uh, to give us information about uh, the voluntary protocols applied by slaughterhouses or farmers. So we try to push the supply chain to have this kind of information. If we are not able to find them, we look for them through our expert teams. So we go on searching from this kind uh, of information also internally with expert uh, by ECHEC. The first level of the tool is based on the analysis of the regulatory framework, so the laws on animal welfare of the country of origin. So in this case, we consider eight legal requirements uh, on the protection of animals on the farm on the transport during the transportation of the animals uh, and during the time of the killing of the animals. For us, in this first level of the tool, uh, the benchmark is the European legislation. 
Why? Because it's very well uh, developed, uh, so it can be considered the, the, the benchmark and uh, considering this kind of uh, uh, level, uh, if the requirements of the laws are less of the European regulation, in the mathematical tool we will have less points. Uh, the European regulatory framework uh, is very complete uh, mm, because it covers farming, transportation, slaughtering, and uh, any, uh, any, any other kinds of issues related to, to animals, so it's uh, good uh, to, to consider it uh, as a benchmark. On the second level of the tool, uh, we analyze uh, the uh, voluntary certification schemes, uh, if they exist, uh, if they are applied by the supplier of the tanneries. In this case, we consider how this kind of voluntary certification compare to the local animal welfare legislation. We consider the certification processes uh, and the requirements inside the voluntary certification related to uh, the farm, to the transportation and the killing of the animals. In any case, we are uh, speaking about uh, a mathematical tool, so uh, we are always speaking about a rating, and uh, related to the requirements, uh, we can uh, score, we can have a score from zero to three points, depending on whether the standard fully, partially, or doesn't meet the requirements of the tool. Examples of uh, voluntary standards that we, we, we found uh, during this research are this one listed in these slides. For example, we found Red Tractor in Great Britain, Better Leaven applied in Germany, Netherlands, and Belgium, Caru, Awa, La Rouge, Bedr, Danish Crown, Bienestar, according to the different origin places of, uh, the, of the ladders. These are only examples, but for us it's very important to find these standards and consider that uh, only if these standards are available and we are able to read them and to consider the requirements, uh, we can uh, see if they meet or not uh, the requirements of the tool. At the end, we can have a maximum score of 100 points. 60 points related to the level one, 40 points related to the level two. Uh, higher is the score, lower is the risk for the tannery. Um, the tool is customized because uh, each kind of requirements and uh, rating finally is weighted according to the purchased volume of leather purchased by the tannery during the 12 months uh, that is under audit. So the final rating is really related according to the country uh, that are uh, um, the, the country of referment for the tannery, uh, they buy leather from this country and uh, they are related to the animal welfare standard if they exist applied by their specific suppliers. So the final rating is related to what have been purchased by the tannery in the previous year uh, of, uh, of the audit. That's an example of the final uh, output of the risk analysis. This is the level one. You can see the criteria listed and uh, examples of the final uh, points and rating according to this, in this example, three different countries of origin. This is the second level. I know that it's very small, the, the, the words in the slide, but we have the different criteria in the labeling uh, scheme, uh, in the certification process, and the, in the requirements of animal welfare in farming and killing and transportation of the animals. And at the end, we have a final, uh, the final rating. Final consideration, uh, we have released uh, since now more than 120 certification of traceability. Uh, more or less 60% of them related to bovine, 20% goats and sheep, uh, and 20% uh, uh, other kinds of species. 90% in Italy and 10% in other countries. And we have uh, an application of the animal welfare tool by uh, 10, uh, 10 tanneries. If you are um, interested in having names, uh, of these uh, tanneries, you can have a look uh, to our database. 
So thank you if there is any question. Questions from the audience? Sabrina, I have a few. <laughs> uh, as we said with uh, other speakers that collecting data is uh, a big issue in the um, work of certification, do you think that for uh, about your tool, uh, it would be hard, it would be difficult for the tanneries to uh, collect the data from their uh, suppliers? Yes, um, it's not so simple. Every one of us works with traceability for many years uh, and uh, for sure when we started 10 years ago was very difficult to find names of slaughterhouses for example and now is the same at the, uh, at the beginning of uh, a new issue, new tools, uh, it's uh, very hard to have all the information uh, but we try to push the supply chain uh, to do this uh, uh, asking the tannery to ask to their suppliers to find out the voluntary schemes. We search with our internal expert, but we have to be a little bit patient uh, on this uh, because I am sure that uh, pushing uh, in uh, one, two or three years, we will have more and more information. What helps us uh, is also to collect every information that we find in a database. Uh, so everything can be organized uh, and uh, shared uh, if it is possible with other tanneries and uh, if it is possible also with brands interested uh, in sharing information with us. Okay, and uh, about the risk analysis, uh, who can read the results of mm. your work? We publish uh, the results of traceability certification in the website because it's a certification so we have to uh, make public uh, the final results uh, of these uh, traceability schemes. The risk analysis, uh, uh, it's a risk analysis, it's not another certification, it's an integration. Uh, we underline in the database uh, who make this kind of analysis, but we cannot publish uh, the contents. Mm, we release uh, the contents of this work uh, to the tanneries, and they are free if they want uh, to share any kinds of information with their customer. But uh, let me do the uh, work of um, a body a certification, so I have to protect the confidenti confidentiality of the data of our uh, clients, of our tanneries, and so uh, we shall be transparent on what can be made uh, published but not with the specific contents of the risk analysis. Uh, it's in the end of the tannery and they can share it if they want. Okay, thank you Sabrina. An applause to Sabrina, please. No question? Okay, thank you. Our last speaker is uh, Francesca Romana Rinaldi, researcher, author, is the director of the SDA Bocconi Monitor for Circular Fashion. Francesca, which are the key results of your activities and which are the new frontiers for the 2023? I will take this one. Okay, so thank you everyone, first of all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I will be using uh, this, I will say, to go on with the presentation. All right, so uh, I will talk about the results 2022. As a matter of fact, we are working now on the third year of the Monitor for Circular Fashion. Um, let's consider the Monitor for Circular Fashion a um, research project. Um, also, I would say a multi-stakeholder research project, uh, but um, also uh, our community, a community of companies, uh, leading players working upstream um, in the um, uh, fashion value chains uh, and also downstream in the fashion value chains with a multitude of service providers uh, building this ecosystem that we all need uh, around circularity. There is also a KPI committee, uh, KPI's committee um, that um, uh, and ICEC actually joined this year um, and in 2022 was uh, represented by uh, consulting companies on um, so we do have uh, uh, this um, strong community, I will say, uh, that is fully participating to the activities of the monitor um, and I will say that this is the approach that we need uh, in order to work towards circularity. So it's a co-creation uh, process, uh, I will say, as well. 
Uh, what is the main goal of the monitor for circular fashion? Uh, the main goal, and we touched these points actually several times uh, today, uh, I would say one of the main goals is the one of um, uh, trying to work together with all these players, all these stakeholders, to identify KPIs that can measure circularity. For us, circularity is not that simple. For us, circularity means to start from traceability. Uh, all the companies of the Monitor for Circular Fashion um, joined a commitment. Um, they answered a call to action. Uh, it was mentioned uh, before, I think, by uh, Gustavo Cotanze, but also uh, several other times, uh, which is the UNEC Traceability and Transparency uh, Call to Action. Uh, so we decided to join because we all believe that there is no way to accelerate circularity and sustainability without working on traceability. And we know there are many efforts that we still need to face in order to implement traceability. Um, definitely, there is also the um, difficulty and the challenge we need to solve of having multiple standards. Um, so uh, this is definitely a topic we want to participate in in order to reduce this complexity and have a common standard. And the one we are referring to is the UNEC uh, traceability standard. Uh, we also have other objectives among this, uh, the one of creating a community, a strong community around circularity, uh, and also um, trying to influence, I would say, the policy makers on regulations that are related to sustainability and circularity. Um, so that's um, a path, this is a journey, and uh, we just entered in the third year 2023 of the monitor. Um, before going on, I would like to invite you to read the report because what we are going to present today, and I won't be alone actually, uh, there will be also some representatives, some of the companies of the monitor, um, the ones that will also introduce to you um, a pilot project, one of the eight pilot projects that we presented uh, last year, 2022. Um, but I definitely invite you to read the report because it's going uh, very much in depth uh, into some topics I've, I will just touch. Uh, so it makes sense to actually have a look and read the report and you will find everything uh, on the um, website um, uh, of the monitor. So sdabocconi.it slash circular fashion. Uh, this is just a picture representing a presentation, so representing the moment in which we present uh, the report and uh, is our think tank is a moment in which the companies meet other companies and we uh, would like to, of course, expand the conversation uh, even more. Last year we invited also European Commission, uh, Eurotex, uh, of course, uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, and we would love to keep um, on uh, with this conversation uh, and make it broader and broader. Uh, so we started from um, uh, a desk analysis, as we always do in uh, SDA Bocconi, which uh, you probably know is the business school of Bocconi uh, University. Uh, in our school of management, um, we, we need to implement uh, a scientific approach, and this is what we did also with the monitor for circular fashion, uh, powered by NLX. Um, so what we did was to start with a desk analysis, uh, and this year was especially focused on uh, also um, uh, all the reports related to circularity with a focus on the fashion industry, with a specific attention to um, uh, sustainability claims and eco-design, which became our key two focuses for 2022. And I will tell you more about this. Um, we also started from a broad analysis of the regulations, of the proposals, the draft proposals uh, that we found at European level. And uh, we also monitored with a high level of attention, I will say, the mm, textile transition pathway. Uh, you probably know the co-creation approach of the European Commission with the companies um, of the textile, clothing, leather and footwear industry overall. So leather was included too. Um, so what we did was to um, understand if we were aligned with um, the European Commission, and we actually were, and we will continue going in that direction, always considering the new upcoming regulations and even the draft proposals, um, and also um, make a further direction to the monitor for circular fashion. 
We would also like to give suggestions and, uh, on the other side, give feedback to the European Commission. So we will not just take, but also give. Um, so as said, our priority for 2022 was to focus on two key research questions, basically. How to make a good sustainability claim and for us, a good sustainability claim is a claim that is starting from traceability. Um, so as said, uh, um, the companies that we invited today from the monitor um, will present a pilot project and you will see that the sustainability claim of this pilot project uh, is made strong by KPIs and every single word that is composing this sustainability claim is starting from data. Um, also traceability data. Of course, this is just a pilot. Uh, we need to industrialize. Uh, we need to go back to the very beginning. We just focus uh, for this project specifically, um, and it will be presented by all the moda uh, on um, um, uh, waste of leather. So it's actually a, a pre-consumer waste. Uh, so there was um, no way in that case uh, to work on traceability upstream. Um, but we know where we need to go and we know uh, the direction to take uh, and we also know the challenges that we have on traceability. Um, the second one is that which are the key eco-design principles and how they can be implemented. And when we talk about eco-design, uh, we talk about eco-design principles that need to be implemented to all the activities of the value chain. So not just at the very beginning. So it's not just about choosing the right circular inputs, but it's about implementing eco-design principles ac across uh, all the activities of the value chain. So in a nutshell, what we did was to focus on these two uh, major uh, research uh, areas. Um, we mm, refined the KPIs that we identified in year one across all the activities of the value chain, traceability, transparency, circularity, and sustainability KPIs. This year, 2023, we have the challenge of updating these KPIs and adapting them also to the um, leather value chain. Uh, and we'll be working together with this um, objective as a co-creation approach again, and we'll also receive the support of uh, the new entries, I will say, and we'll be working together also with uh, UNICH and um, ICEC. So um, testing the tailored KPIs for fashion was the major focus of the um, pilot projects in uh, 2022. As said, we had eight pilot projects. And I also would like to share some characteristics of the KPIs that we included for the measuring uh, um, of this um, performance, uh, the circularity performance. Uh, they had to be smart, triple C. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound, but also clear, comparable, and cost effective. And we worked on KPIs that were at product level uh, but also a process level, especially for the um, B2B industrialized projects. We had one, for example, we had to work on the process level, so process KPIs. And for some other ones, instead, uh, since we had just a pilot project, uh, B2C, um, we could work on uh, product KPIs. So in a nutshell, um, which were the results of uh, year one, uh, which we bring along, of course, and we will refresh actually these results. Uh, and again, you will find much more in the report 2021 and report 2022 of the monitor. Um, but basically, uh, what we would like to do is also to refresh and update these results, um, looking at the circular, circular fashion trade-offs which um, are the main issues that we need to solve if we want to go in the same direction with circularity and sustainability. We know that sometimes it's not possible and it's not feasible at the moment, but we also, as a community of companies, we would like to solve some of those issues and also help the industry overall to solve some of those issues. For example, uh, higher operational complexity, environmental impacts of processes, including logistics. Um, so the more you go circular, it should be that you also go more for sustainability. Sometimes uh, this is not happening. The more you go circular, the more you have to face uh, trade-offs. Um, so 
that's um, uh, actually the idea, and uh, you will find also many other trade-offs, such as the availability of volumes, costs that await profits, lead time and time to market, and also quality issues. Um, we understood clearly which are the um, advantages that are coming from circularity. Um, more than anything else, the company um, uh, confirmed that there is an improved branded reputation, but also a different uh, final user loyalty, a different relationship that you can build with the final consumer. Let me just make an example. Whenever you include uh, your uh, final consumers in the discussion saying, okay, you can take back your product, the one you already used, uh, you can take it back in the store and then we will start from there another uh, process, another mm, manufacturing process, uh, maybe recycling uh, uh, or just repairing uh, the product uh, as an additional service that we can provide. Well, you definitely work on uh, customer loyalty. So you build another relationship and here we have actually many players that are already working on this. Uh, I, let me just mention Patagonia, which in Milan opened a repair station in the store, and it's a permanent repair station. So they do have this service that is for free, <laughs> uh, for Patagonia, it doesn't have to, for free, to be for free in um, uh, any case, but in that case it is, and it's changing completely the relationship that they keep open uh, with the final consumer. Um, new business opportunities, new jobs, uh, and uh, in some cases even cost reduction uh, are definitely the firelight. So we know where we need to get. There are also issues to be solved. Costs, availability of technologies in certain cases, availability of infrastructure, the also lack or um, need to fine tune, let's say, uh, either the external culture or the even the internal culture of the company. Those are all obstacles that we need to solve. But we also know, and let me add, since today we are discussing about traceability, that traceability is also um, uh, a challenge. And we need to start, we understood, from traceability in order to sustain the messages and sustain and substantiate the circularity and sustainability claims. So it's um, definitely it requires a lot of efforts, but is also um, the big um, opportunities that are coming from traceability and circularity as well. What is the firelight and what should guide also the investments? Um, as said before, when we talk about um, circularity for us is not just uh, recycling, definitely is much more. Uh, we identify, uh, identified uh, five different business models around circularity. Uh, it's not just the use of sustainable inputs. Uh, it's also about uh, life extension. I mentioned before repairing services. And you know how much the European Commission is pushing on this. Uh, um, if not, uh, you can uh, definitely go to the uh, textile transition pathway results and you will find this word repeated many, many, many times. Um, so recycling, repairing are important keywords uh, today. Mm, uh, definitely uh, end of life, so recycling and regeneration, upcycling and downcycling, but also some additional uh, business models that are not represented in the monitor for circular fashion at the moment, such as sharing, so peer-to-peer -peer platforms for sharing, uh, and um, product as a service, uh, rental, subscription rental and leasing. When we went in year one and measured uh, the implementation of these um, uh, circularity activities and uh, the five business models for circularity, including among the activities, waste management, green logistics, of course, and with key enablers of traceability and transparency, we understood uh, that um, uh, the business model upstream, let's say the use of circular inputs, is much more implemented than the ones that we can find uh, along the value chain and towards uh, downstream. Um, it makes sense, meaning that it will take also time in order to include the customers in the conversation and also to find the right way of involving the customers uh, in circularity. Uh, but we are, we are ready, we are ready to do it, the companies are ready to do it, uh, we just need to find the right um, and implement and test the right processes. 
So we, um, as said, worked on eight pilot projects, um, starting from um, some clear principles coming from UNEC, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, uh, on how to make a good sustainability claim, clarity, truthfulness, relevance, reliability, and disclosure had to be there. And also, we identified uh, some key principles of eco-design, uh, starting from the desk research that we made. Uh, and we identified uh, um, these 10, and uh, we regrouped them uh, in an eco-design framework. Uh, we include durability, reusability, reparability, and recyclability into the circular life cycle. Uh, health and safety. Um, where safe chemical substances and minimize microfiber release, and finally, sustainable inputs. So the use of renewable inputs, recyclable in inputs, uh, recycle inputs, and resources reduction. And we implemented these eco-design principles uh, in the different pilot projects, measuring the results and measuring with the specific KPIs uh, um, the circularity that was implemented through them. Uh, we will present today, thanks to the participation of um, Oldi Moda and also um, an additional player that we involved, is not part of the monitor, uh, but we decided to support also um, players, especially startups. And in this case, uh, uh, we're talking about um, 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 actually a, um, a different kind of a startup. Um, um, cooperative, actually, um, Progetto Quid, together with the support of Temera, that will be also involved and they will be presenting later on, um, we will introduce Think Ladder. Uh, so we joined the pledge uh, of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, it's called the Sustainability Pledge, and we personalize uh, our commitment uh, uh, consistently with um, the objectives of the Monitor for Circular Fashion. So we wanted to, um, first of all, work on uh, partnerships, partnership along the value chain and the partnership along the pipeline, building reliable sustainability claims to fight greenwashing. Uh, so you will find in all the pilot projects always uh, the co-creation approach and the working together of different players of the industry, and you will find uh, uh, the implementation of uh, the principles to make a good sustainability claim supported by data in all the pilot projects. Also, we wanted to implement and test the industry-specific KPIs into real-life products, referring to the circular fashion activities, the ones uh, we mentioned before, and we try to have uh, all the activities implemented in the pilot projects. So we'll see some uh, with the Think Leather uh, project. So implementing the eco-design principles in a real-life product was challenging. We had to implement that iterative uh, approach, meaning uh, many different meetings with companies, uh, with the KPIs committee, fine-tuning uh, also these pilot projects and the KPIs to be implemented with clear guidelines. Uh, but at the end, uh, we made it, and uh, the result, again, is visible uh, in the report. Which are the next steps? Well, the next steps for us will be, in some cases, industrializing the pilot projects, so to see how these KPIs can be implemented on industrial scale, extending the KPIs also to other products and processes, uh, and also adapting the KPIs uh, to the new um, uh, ladder value chain uh, that we are uh, going to introduce, let's say, this year. We started already with uh, um, Oldi Moda, thanks to Oldi Moda last year, and we will focus uh, a little more on that this year, 2023. Here you see a snapshot of the UNEC 2021 Business Process Analysis for Sustainability and Circularity in the Ladder Value Chain uh, report that I definitely suggest you to read which is a um, um, very complete, uh, outstanding uh, document in which um, a very extensive analysis was carried out, uh, also with the support of many of the stakeholders that are here, more than 250 actually, um, highlighting, uh, among the many things, the sustainability risks that we need to consider when we enter into a specific value chain, such as um, uh, leather, 
as was mentioned already uh, before today by WWF and also many other uh, speakers. So deforestation, uh, biodiversity, animal welfare, air pollution, water pollution, hazard chemistry um, and salt, um, solid waste, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, we are going to go, uh, thanks also to the support of uh, Unic and ICEC, uh, and all the companies of the Monitor for Circular Fashion through the analysis of uh, all these risks and based also on the risk analysis, we will fine tune the KPIs to be implemented to the pilot projects. Um, we will also think about the future. We are here as a business school to give suggestions as well, not just to summarize, let's say, and to collect inputs. And um, our exercise will be also thinking about what's next, what's going to happen, what's going to happen maybe 10 years uh, from now. Uh, we know that the um, resources, uh, and I'm not just uh, talking about leather, but talking about cotton and many other resources are going to be um, are reduced and are going to be scarce, scarcer and scarce, more scarce uh, year after year. So circularity approaches uh, are a must. Uh, we don't need to think that it's just a complex thing to be implemented. Uh, but it's really a must. We just need to find the way, and probably the best way, uh, in order to create synergies and in order to also create new jobs and new opportunities uh, to implement them. Uh, definitely, uh, the key word durability is something that uh, is going to characterize uh, a lot uh, of our discussions when especially we think about leather um, uh, repairing, uh, but also new systems for tanning, for example, uh, where and also new innovative, responsible innovation approaches to do tanning. Uh, this is something that uh, we, we foresee and uh, mm, as a matter of fact, if uh, anyone in the room, uh, and uh, we will explore also uh, the in Pelle and the fair, if there are new innovations, we will love to accelerate these innovations. So please get in touch with the Monitor for Circular Fashion. I will leave you the contacts at the end. So we are here also to talk about how to scale up. How can we scale up these innovations? And there are key, uh, four key priorities uh, that we have, that we decided to have within the Monitor for Circular Fashion. Uh, among these, I told you many times already, implementing eco-design principles along, to all, mm, along all the activities of the value chain through eco-design KPIs, uh, leveraging on a common traceability and transparency standard to build sustainability and also uh, circularity claims against greenwashing, scaling up circularity through technological innovation to accelerate transition, and scaling up circular innovation through collaboration. And here, I would like to underline this year, 2023, we also launched a C factor, so a X factor for circularity, basically, um, uh, willing to um, accelerate, to give visibility, but also to introduce to the community of uh, medium and large companies that we have in the monitor, um, to uh, introduce them in order to scale up, again, their, circular, their, their um, uh, innovation. We have these priorities and we checked also the upcoming uh, EU regulation already announced. You cannot read them uh, very well here, but again, I invite you to read the overall report. You see all the stakeholders are involved, policymakers, companies, and the industry overall. And um, uh, we selected some of them. Some are really priority for us. And we will monitor them step by step, especially this year. Well, uh, when uh, lots <laughs> of regulations um, and directives are expected, uh, and we will be ready to share comments uh, also with the Commission. Um, so I will say that's it as an introduction. As I promised, uh, if you would like to uh, know more about the monitor, uh, these are my contacts, so please get in touch. Um, and um, I think here you also have the website of the monitor. So if you like to read the um, reports, the manifesto, and uh, all the KPIs are actually there in a very transparent way. So now I would like to invite, uh, as I promised to do, um, I hope I'm on, on time, yeah, um, the, the team, okay, starting from uh, Veronica Bovo, Chief Sustainability Officer at Oldi Moda, 
which was leading uh, this project, uh, so the um, Think Leather project. So I'll leave you the floor, first of all, to introduce all the moda. Probably there is no need to uh, introduce all the moda. Um, you know, it's a very important vendor we have um, in Italy. So you're actually helping us to, to sustain the Made in Italy. Um, but please, uh, take some time to introduce uh, all the moda and then uh, um, introduce also Think Leather. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you. Hello everybody. Um, so all the moda. As far as I go. Okay. Um, all the moda is part of Holding Industriale uh, in the SPA. Um, in the is uh, uh, an industrial project, uh, um, quite different from the financial projects uh, that um, are similar to, uh, to ours, but are more um, incentrated into the financial aspect of it. Our is an industrial. Um, aggregation, um, so we invest in uh, SMEs to uh, favor um, economic growth, uh, um, internationalization and um, um, generational exchange to preserve the made in Italy. Uh, we have uh, different buildings, uh, we have education, uh, uh, automotive after parts, food and beverage, uh, robotics, but um, the biggest one is uh, um, the fashion one, H Moda, which is uh, um, a luxury uh, made of lux luxury companies. Um, first of all, we um, did an horizontal um, integration of the supply chain, so we cover different uh, um, um, product categories uh, such as jersey, um, lead, um, leather outerwear, um, outer other outerwear. Um, shirts, uh, dresses, um, uh, we also have uh, um, accessories, leather accessories, um, and uh, sneakers, but in denim. But we also, the last two uh, companies that we bought is uh, basically, we invested in is um, a printing and seri um, serigraphy uh, printing and embroidery. Uh, we also have uh, um, quite an innovative uh, way of doing business because also, uh, apart from uh, all these m &As, we also have an academy which is uh, specialized into um, preserving the, um, the work of the Made in Italy um, because it's uh, artisanal and is getting lost. Uh, um, nobody wants to do it anymore and it's becoming uh, quite essential to preserve it. We do also invest in the metaverse, uh, um, in the 3D prototypes. Uh, uh, we have uh, obviously a sustainability department and uh, traceability. What um, I'm gonna talk to you briefly about our sustainability project. We, in uh, September 21, I joined um, uh, Oldie Modem, uh, Olding Industriale and uh, obviously focusing in, uh, in the um, uh, Oldie Moda sector. And we try to uh, take the three, the three business pillars, which is uh, education and culture, made in Italy and innovation, and uh, um, ethic and sustainability, and try to translate it into a strategy. Because without a strategy, you can't do any of the uh, environmental and uh, social projects, and uh, you cannot do also uh, governance. <laughs> Um, so we um, try to uh, divide five business pill five sustainability pillars, which is developing the culture of sustainability, because obviously without the cultures, uh, we cannot um, try to bring the company to a new level. Um, putting people first, um, creating value for the territory and the stakeholders, and uh, uh, responsibility innovation. We um, chose six uh, SDGs, which were uh, more um, keen to um, identify our um, values, which is the fourth um, education, the fifth uh, gender equality, the eighth uh, um, economic growth, the ninth innovation, uh, the twelfth um, circular economy, and the thirteenth uh, um, climate change. Um, doing this, we created a framework of uh, um, materiality projects, uh, which are about 15 materiality projects into the, the um, governance, uh, the environmental and the social areas. And uh, we did a, f a few uh, projects already in the first year. Um, we um, decided that to um, be sustainable, first of all, we need to measure ourselves uh, with data. 
um, and to be transparent to our stakeholders. So we um, did our first uh, sustainability report, which is uh, voluntary because we are not uh, um, uh, into um, the market, uh, mm, so we're not in, in Borsa, so we didn't have to do it. Uh, but we also wanted to assure it by a third party, thus giving us uh, a way of working uh, and to focus uh, ourselves on the things we needed to do better. Uh, we also won uh, a sustainability award, the top uh, 100. So in uh, um, Forbes, uh, we were um, in, in the first uh, 100 uh, Italian companies, uh, more sustainable. We have a project which is called the Ghost Makers, which basically try to um, certify uh, with a small uh, ESG rating uh, um, our supply chain, uh, thus providing uh, transparency and traceability to our brands. And uh, we have uh, an ESG rating uh, with the CDPX uh, Carbon Disclosure Project. Talking about um, thing, uh, our um, pilot project, Think Ladder, um, basically we had uh, um, a problem in one of our um, um, companies, uh, which is uh, the accessory, uh, the leather accessory company, Gab, um, which uh, uh, was basically uh, quite a bit of a leftover uh, from uh, the um, uh, from leather, which uh, was used for um, making the bags and uh, and the accessories that they do make. So um, what we did was um, to with Francesca to try and find uh, um, a not to recycle it just uh, into um, a second uh, and product, but basically to try and upcycle it. Um, but we wanted to create uh, um, a, a transparency uh, of the whole cycle. So we um, joined the uh, project, uh, project Quid, which is the social um, impact uh, uh, cooperative, uh, which uh, uh, was born to um, uh, help help uh, uh, women in uh, victim of violence. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a small structure, but it's very um, uh, it's, it's in the third sector, and they um, and they do projects to try and take uh, these women off the streets, uh, and also victim of violence uh, or ex uh, refugees. Um, and we partner with Tamara. Um, which is the blockchain uh, to try and uh, um, uh, give transparency and uh, um, find some uh, sustainability claim to add value to this product. Um, just coming back, this, these are the products. Uh, uh, we made a small uh, uh, leather accessories uh, um, such as uh, iPads uh, and um, um, folders for pens. Um, what, what we did was to work uh, and uh, obviously in the end of life because we, um, the, the, the beginning of the product was an end of life uh, product, but we um, applied principles of eco design. So we didn't make the product, uh, the products uh, uh, too much structured. We didn't add uh, um, uh, embellishments because we wanted to, to be easy disassembled. Um, so we worked on, um, uh, on really making it uh, uh, quite simple um, and, uh, and easy to disassemble. Uh, we um, find the uh, raw materials uh, history of, uh, of the leather we had. Um, so where, where it was uh, uh, sourced, uh, what, uh, um, what uh, were the animals used uh, um, for, for it. Uh, but obviously we couldn't, um, because it was such a, um, an end of life product, we, we didn't have, for example, some of the um, um, measurements that we wanted. For example, we didn't have uh, uh, chemical analysis to it. So um, we want for the industrialization, we want next year to um, add, uh, add to this and try to make uh, some uh, uh, chemical analysis to even um, ensure that it's uh, more uh, uh, traceable and more uh, uh, sustainable. And I think I, w I can uh, leave uh, to Tamara uh, to explain the rest.
thank you so much. And uh, of course, um, we are available, you're available. So if you have questions on the specific pilot project, we will now go with Temera. Uh, a little bit more in depth and uh, specifically with Anna, Anna Bonciani, product owner at Temera, um, on which was the process. So how we did it, uh, first of all, who is Temera? <laughs> okay, so maybe not everyone knows Temera. So it makes sense to introduce the company first, uh, but then um, we'd like to explain probably a little bit better how we did it, uh, how you, um, you supported uh, us, all the companies, and of course SDA Bocconi, uh, for building the digital voice uh, of um, the traceability. Thank you, Francesca, and thank you all for being here and to giving us this opportunity to talk all together about this amazing project that we made together with the Monitor for Circular Fashion the last year. We are, in a very brief, in two words, we are Temera. I am the product owner of Dicker, which is the uh, last module of Temera uh, regarding the traceability of raw material and finished product in terms of sustainability and data compliance, mm, sustainability data compliance. Uh, I, I won't bother you with all the information about the five countries that we cover in Temera and so on, and I switch directly to the question of Francesca. We helped all the um, partners inside uh, Monitor for Circular Fashion to give the digital voice to their pilot project. At the end, what we did, we put a QR code and an FC tag, which are kind of zipped, I think, QR code now are pretty famous, um, and we uh, collect all the information about the process that this pilot project had, and we, including documents and certificates that the brands in a very courageous way give us, and we provide to the final consumers um, the opportunity to discover this information by themselves. So giving, th because this is exactly what Temera does, as you can see here in this representation, we um, cover the full traceability of starting from sourcing, so from raw material to the final and to the digital voice to the, cons to the consumers. We have different modules. We start with raw material traceability and we have the care. Then we can go very deep and in our core business, which is the traceability in uh, manufacturing and distribution, retail and wholesalers, to the final consumers, thanks to uh, this approach, giving digital voices to the product, okay? Here, the, he, um, we have the vision that we are approaching right now, thanks to the, how can I say, upcoming inputs of the market that we receive from our clients and also in general from the market and also thanks to the Monitor for Circular Fashion. So as you can see, we have a module and we cover different uh, parts of the process of making a product. So from the sourcing of the mm, raw material to the recycling and the upcycling, thanks to the digital passport. We are delivering this uh, passport, <laughs> which uh, will be mandatory for every finished product on the market, I think around 2013, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, and if we don't have any other ch changes in the rules and the um, uh, regulatory. So we are working, uh, providing a unique identifier also in the raw materials, not only in the finished product, to connect all the supply chain that will become the value chain until the consumers. So in one hand, thank, thanks to uh, our devices, mobile phones, uh, tablets, uh, PCs and so on, all the information can be um, retrievable. And we can ensure all uh, this kind of this, this information in the blockchain. So the blockchain is not a real habilitator, it's just a technology behind the real value chain that we are using to provide information. So this is just an overview of our main clients that we, uh, we work with 
and uh, I'm done. I don't know if you have some other question um, on the pilot project. Otherwise, I will let I will leave the the microphone to quit. Thank you so much. Let's see if there is any question uh, now. Actually, otherwise we we just. Um, uh, so Quid actually just joined us. So is the right? I think we have another presentation for Quid. So we just uh, need to switch um, a moment. Um, so we introduce um, Quid already several times. But let me ju just say one more time um, that it, it's a pleasure uh, also for the Monitor for Circular Fashion to collaborate with external players, especially innovative SMEs, uh, but also social cooperatives um, and. Companies that are growing, uh, uh, including uh, in their mission, in their mission statement, the triple bottom line approach. Too many times when we talk about circularity, there is the focus on environment. And the companies of the Monitor for Circular Fashion kept on saying, uh, okay, but we should also talk about the social aspects. We should talk about the social aspects. We should, we should do something in order to internally, of course, in our companies, but also. Uh, with external players, we should uh, engage uh, also on the social aspects. So who better than uh, Quid to do it? So I would like to leave the floor now to Valeria, Valeria Valotto, uh, Vice President of Quid, in order to um, introduce us in the world of Quid and also talk about our collaboration for this uh, pilot project, one of the three that we had uh, in 2022. Thank you so much, Valeria. Thank you, Francesca, for having us here, and thank you, everyone. Um, so, who is Quid? Uh, I hope you don't know anything about us, otherwise there, would, there, would, there wouldn't be a point in attending events. So I'm going to tell you the story from the start. Uh, Quid is uh, a 10-year-old uh, social enterprise on a mission to redesign uh, made in Italy fashion in order to reimagine the labor market. So um, in, this, uh, in this very short sentence, uh, we tackle, as Francesca uh, anticipated, both social and environmental impact. How we do that? We give a new lease of life to both fabrics and a new opportunity, a second chance. We hope it's the best chance to those who are most at risk of labor exclusion in the labor um, in, in, the, in the in the in the Italian job market and especially to women. Um, what we are, yeah, we are um, a, a women-led company. Um, initially, when we were founded, a girls-led company. Now, women-led uh, um, company, and we are circular by nature. These are our three uh, tenets, our three pillars. We mm, we. We recover overstock fabric, so excess fabric, which we then transform into limited edition collections, which we distribute both B2B and B2C. Um, and of course, in, that, I, 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 in this process, what we do is to flip and turn upside down the normal design process, because where normally the supply chain, uh, the fashion supply chain would stop, that's where our collections um, start existing and take life. So we first plan, we, we first check the overstock fabric that we have in stock. And then based on that, um, um, we, we develop our collections. The B2C collections, which are distributed in eight stores, and then the B2B collections, which are in pre basically solidarity sourcing initiatives that we co-create uh, uh, with brands that have an interest in sustainability and are exploring sustainability, uh, but don't have the, a, a full sustainable process yet in place. So we come in as a plug and play solution uh, to, to these companies, and they are both fashion and lifestyle companies. And at the same time, we foster um, talent diversity in our workshops uh, and factory. Uh, Today, we employ 145 uh, uh, people, 84% women, and 60% who at some point of their lives have struggled uh, uh, with employment and have struggled on the, on the job market. And that ranges uh, enormously 
from uh, people with a migration background, women with a migration background, to people um, um, with a disability, to um, mothers who are trying to re-enter the job markets and uh, are finding it extremely challenging and difficult, especially in the post-pandemic scenario, the social impact uh, and the social impact that fashion can uh, bring to, to, to the ecosystem has become uh, uh, very visible, very tangible in our case. Here you see some pictures of uh <laughs> where I normally work. <laughs> it's our workshop and uh, um, our, our showroom and then of course some of, some of the fabrics that, uh, um, that we store. And that's again, um, um, a description um, of how our supply chain can turn limits into starting points. So where circularity, that's our way, lim turning limits into starting points in, in our view and uh, according to our vision is actually the nectar of entrepreneurship in that entrepreneurs have the uh, privilege to find solutions, but then when they are social entrepreneurs, then they find solutions, uh, not only to problems or whims, but to uh, real societal challenges. Uh, but at the same time, um, I we believe that limits can tr be transformed by uh, in starting points by um, entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. But at the same time, we believe that our uh, own um, supply chain as a, fa as, a, um, as a fashion brand has, um, has has really the power and the potential to transform limit into starting points in uh, in the frame in the framework of circular um, supply chains. Uh, so we we 95 percent of the fabric that we employ in our um, collections, both B two B and B two C, uh, is excess fabric that it's donated by a network of over 50 mills and. Um, uh, and textile makers or printers. Uh, and in addition to that, in the last two years, we've been working um, on um, dead stock and stock and overstock of leather. And that's the reason why then we were approached by Francesca. Uh, this is, of course, in the, um, in the, in the luxury district uh, in Scandici is an issue. Uh, overstock, leather overstock, uh, um, is something that companies and uh, sustainability officers uh, are struggling with and that's where we hope to be able to come in as a plug and play solution to make the most and to catalyze both the environmental, uh, reduce the environmental impact and catalyze the social impact of this overstock, which um, um, is extremely expensive for the ecosystem, for the environment. Uh, and uh, how can we uh, transform it into something that can uh, give back value, both in social terms and environmental terms. The fabric comes in into our warehouses, thanks to uh, the very diverse uh, talent we cultivate in our workshops uh, and we develop in our workshops, then the fabric is transformed into uh, garments or accessories and then it's distributed both B2C and B2B. B2B in solidarity sourcing schemes. Here are some of the brands we are currently collaborating with and we've collaborated with in the past. And then B2C uh, in our quid stores. And of course, both our stores and the, collabor and the B2B collaborations become opportunities for um, uh, uh, raising the awareness uh, and uh, um, and uh, and working on outreach programs uh, in which we engage both clients and customers, uh, as we believe that working in in a network uh, and um, uh, contaminating ecosystems, so profit, non-profit, uh, fashion, and social, is the key to uh, resilient communities. And that's some of the, uh, some of the, well, it's only, uh, of course, we have to add mm, this year's data, but uh, up to um, 2021, so until 2021, we, we had recovered over 1,400, 500 uh, uh, kilometers of fabric. And uh, uh, I think with this year, 
we are uh, we are reaching almost a, a 2,000 kilometers. So it's uh, definitely a, a challenge that of uh, fabric waste um, or fabric overstock to which uh, there seems to be uh, an answer and uh, and a solution that we seem to be able to provide. But uh, of course, then the challenge is uh, is huge. And as we delve deeper and deeper into the fashion ecosystem, then we realized that fabric, uh, that in addition to fabric, leather is also um, uh, something, over leather overstock is something then that needs to be tackled, especially um, in Italy and in the, in the Made in Italy ecosystem. Okay, partnership. Uh, we were, uh, as we pioneer uh, social entrepreneurship and sustainable fashion, then we are often approached by Francesca, <laughs> as a, and the whole and the whole and the whole monitor, uh, of course. As um, and because we are always eager to uh, experiment, as as it is in our DNA as social entrepreneurs, we were approached and uh, asked to um, work on a leather overstock that we um, have received from Gab. Um, uh, and transform it into something that could be useful, and not only useful, but also beautiful. And we came up uh, with um, um, a, a set and a series of uh, several um, samples of uh, pencil cases, and it's definitely this kind of small accessory uh, that can be it's small and beautiful, um, that we are um, um, piloting at this moment in the in the in in the, in the small but uh, very promising leather um, supply chain that we are uh, building in collaboration with uh, partners. So Gab in this case, but uh, also uh, other brands are uh, the, the interest is really um, increasing and raising. So we hope. Despite not working uh, with a on a f on a um, on a leather um, production on a stable leather pro leather production at the moment, we definitely um, foresee that this is uh, definitely a viable direction, and we are very grateful <laughs> for <laughs> uh, engaging us in this because uh, we, we we truly believe that uh, um, SDG the 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 the, the most um, disruptive of the of the SDG is number 17. So uh, partnership for the goals and uh, thanks to the monitor, we are definitely able to explore different ways to partner up uh, with uh, Made in Italy fashion to make Made in Italy more sustainable in, in many respects. So thank you, thank you again. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Valeria. Uh, we need to thank you as well. And um, again, this was one of the three we worked on with the Progetto Quid and Quid in general. Um, uh, new companies actually entered the Monitor for Circular Fashion. Um, so um, I cannot show you anymore, but um, uh, some new players in the leather industry already joined. Um, Todd's, uh, Salvatore Ferragamo, uh, and new one may join also in the next uh, months or years. Um, so we really thank you for um, the attention and uh, we leave the floor also uh, to our uh, host um, to ask questions in case uh, we have any. We are on time, but thanks to the speakers before us. <laughs> okay. An applause, please, for the initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are questions? Maybe? I just have one. I, uh, I saw that uh, between the members of uh, the, the monitor, there are high end brands luxury brands, but also fast fashion brands. Is circularity affordable for everyone? For, um, circularity, it's a challenge for everyone. Um, we, as a monitor, decided to include in 2022 all business models because we wanted to explore how circularity could be implemented. Uh, as you know, and you're referring to uh, uh, fast fashion retailers, um, that was in the monitor for 2022, um, that has been the leading um, player okay, in terms of uh, transparency, the level of transparency, um, uh, in according to Fashion Transparency Index. 
Um, we discussed many times also in the Monitor for Circular Fashion um, about the term uh, transparency and we believe that transparency and disclosure are essential. Um, but to answer your question, uh, um, circularity is a challenge for all the business models, uh, not just uh, for the mass market. Definitely, I add to this, um, of course, transparency is not enough uh, and all the companies need to work on uh, traceability and transparency. Uh, traceability needs to be the starting point in order to be transparent. Um, and these are the only um, elements and the only, uh, I would say, factors that we can leverage on in order to accelerate sustainability and circularity. The challenges are everywhere, across all segments. Um, but then, of course, um, if we consider um, some business models, such as uh, born sustainable and born circular SMEs, uh, such as Progetto Quid, of course, it will be much easier to have a great uh, sustainability and circularity performance. So I see mm, much more the difference between uh, small players and large players than in between mass market and uh, premium uh, luxury. Uh, but this is uh, overall. Then, of course, we need to go and uh, um, explain much better, analyze, uh, read the data, uh, have LCA uh, data to read uh, in order to really compare. Yeah. Thank you a lot. So uh, thank you for being here. And uh, enjoy Lina Pelle. Enjoy your visit in Milan. Enjoy your stay. Have you a question? Maybe. <laughs> of course, please. I don't like to start with your uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, the later B2B market is not only fashion, it's also automotive uh, and other uh, ones. Are you planning to extend uh, the tuning of a model uh, to the different requirements? Uh, because, uh, for example, uh, circularity in uh, the furniture or automotive uh, usage of a letter is quite different, uh, and uh, so the involvement of final customer is different. Are you working on that? Yeah, Thanks. definitely. For us, uh, B2B is essential. So we are actually involving a lot of companies that are B2B players. I see here, and I can just mention since I see them, uh, YKK, okay, since I see Enrico there, um, and I don't know if I see any other player of the monitor B2B, um, but we have many already, and we know that we need to adapt the KPIs uh, to the B2B. Uh, and this is actually what we did together. But we also know that uh, the B2B um, players will be always more, especially if we think about circularity, b 2 b to c with a B2B2C approach. And it's not by chance uh, that the players that we have in the monitor are great ingredient brands. So the players that are able to not just work with their clients, let's say the brands, uh, um, the, the partners of the monitors, basically, but it's um, an approach, the one they have, that is B2B2C. So they are already thinking about the final customer. I also mentioned Vibram, that is not here because they have a stand, so it's uh, behind the stage, let's say. Um, but yes, definitely, we do have uh, many players, uh, Radici Group uh, and many others, uh, um, uh, Radici, uh, Albini, uh, Manteco, now I, I cannot mention them all, but uh, B2B for us uh, is definitely essential and is the other, mm, I wouldn't say is the other side of the coin, um, uh, they are the central partners we need uh, in order to work on circularity. And uh, during the um, meetings, several meetings we had during these two years together, and we will continue this year, um, that's the beauty, I think, of the monitor, uh, the fact that they wanted to, to share. Um, and most of the time is a B2B and B2C approach that they, they share, actually. Uh, the challenges, but also uh, their the suggestions. So, um, and I will say the beauty of the monitor is the beauty of the companies of the monitor. Thank you. That's all? Okay. Enjoy, enjoy your aperitivo. <laughs> Goodbye.